Welcome to Plato's Cave. I'm Jordan Myers, and I'm a master's student in philosophy at the University of Houston. You're listening to a reading group episode of the show, which means that in this episode, I discuss political philosophy with two non-philosopher friends, Adam and Giffen, because philosophy shouldn't just be for philosophers. So with that introduction, please enjoy our discussion of political philosophy. Oh, you know what I wanted to ask before we start? Um, Because, like, I thought it'd be interesting, and I forgot to ask this at the beginning of the, uh, like, the previous episode, but since we're doing, like, a um, a series on political theory, I don't know, I thought it'd be kind of interesting just to, like, really, really briefly say why we're interested in that. Because, like, I, because it's something that, like, political theory, I've only tangentially explored you know, in undergrad stuff, you know, there have been like readings on it <clears throat> in the context of other classes or, you know, the Colorado seminar I did this summer, there were readings that touched on political topics and everything. But uh, so that's, and, and obviously like another interest of mine is all of the connections it has to moral responsibility, you know, like we've been talking about. But I mean, because Giffen, you were like, you were the most enthusiastic about this series in particular. So maybe, maybe we say something about like why? Um, I'd say I was interested in political philosophy uh, because it informs how you view like the world and the institutions we have in our society and thus can allow you to better identify what aspects and how certain aspects are failing us, basically. Mm -hmm. It's also the most practically applicable area of philosophy, maybe. I mean, besides interpersonal stuff. Yeah, it is. It is. I mean, this is like civilization level. um, Yeah theory it will have impact and for me it's kind of like kind of two-pronged in a sense where i want to kind of grapple with the feasibility of some of the political theory and also you know study the kind of underlying ethics um that kind of undergird different political theories so because i think like once i figure out exactly Mm. which values Mm. undergird certain political theories then i'll be able to better align my own views with those because i i at this point i good point because i i'm pretty sure i know where i you know which which values i i hold as paramount at this point um so i I, it would be good to find which political theory aligns best with those values but also seems most feasible in practice you know yeah that's that's probably that thing even even more broadly you can just kind of explore um all the assumptions not even just like the moral ones that undergird different Mm -hmm. political philosophies because those are things are malleable over you know large stretches of time that's true true for the romans may not be true for us that can inform you know your views it's actually an interesting way in which amoral values can become moral right like like a um efficiency isn't intrinsically a moral value but in the context of competing political theories it could actually become a moral value which is kind of interesting Mm. you know what i mean um and and i just i mean i i hadn't thought about this before we started but um i think maybe I, i have the most disdain for actual politics at least like you know discussing them because everything comes down to like what's you know, what's 51% of the population going to vote for? And like, how do we actually implement this and stuff? And like, I kind of hate a lot of discussions because of all of those nitty gritty concerns. But this is a nice area where you can obviously import those concerns, but they're not the entire conversation also. You know what I mean? Yeah. And even like in the paper we're about to discuss here, I mean, there are pronouncements made by the author about how society should function Mm. but there were kind of points where i'm like exactly how does the author see that obtaining right so but but then like you they actually you know she throws in a line here or there where you're like okay i actually see how that could work Mm. um so Mm -hmm. it that's kind of where i'm interested in the feasibility of it where it's like here's the idea and i without going into you know immense detail it's like okay i could see why that specific you know idea would work um 
Yeah. So, okay. So let's get into it. So the paper, the lengthy paper that we're talking about is what is the point of equality by Elizabeth Anderson. And this was published in 1999 in ethics, which is obviously uh, was and still is the top moral and political philosophy journal. So this was, um, <laughs> this was a banger of a paper in, in to not mince words, but also blanket apology because Adam, you are coming off of COVID and I am on the upswing of COVID. So Giffen, assuming, no you, excuse for me. assuming <laughs> you don't have COVID, <laughs> we, you, we have no excuse or you have no excuse for, for the brain fog that Adam and I have. So I'll do some heavy editing on this episode and try to make us sound reasonable. But, oh, but yeah, also, the, I mean, the problem with that is, is that this paper is what it's some 50 it's odd 50 pages. pages yeah. yeah, it's bulky. So, which is going to add like, a, you know, an additional spin to trying to actually discuss a paper that is that long. Um, so, okay. I thought maybe the reasonable way to do it was m maybe um, say how I understood the overall structure of the paper. And then she does give... <clears throat> At the end of um, uh, page 288 into 289, she, she does give a lot of really good kind of ground laying, I think, of what she's going to do. And then, and then honestly, after that, I mean, you know, it's a long paper. We can't move through it systematically. So yeah. do, do you guys think that's reasonable? Yeah, I can okay. um, start if you prefer. I have a, a decent way to begin, I think. Okay, yeah, do it then. Yeah, so basically the paper is structured um, as two halves, um, and the page count roughly agrees with that as well. The first half is she critiques luck egalitarianism, and then the second half she proposes democratic equality um, hmm. based on her, her, and her critique of luck egalitarianism informs like the structure of democratic equality. Um, so in the first like pages, she mentions like four main luck egalitarians that she, she will critique. Um, Ronald Dworkin, Philip Van Paris or Pari, Richard Arneson, and G.A. Cohen are all, uh, I think those are the main four that she will critique over the paper. Um, so with that in mind, she basically said that all of like these authors and like lucky egalitarians broadly are kind of missing the point of what mm -hmm. egalitarianism is supposed to be about. Um, and we can kind of define lucky egalitarianism shortly. But um, really what she's saying is the point of like equality, you know, in egalitarianism is to end oppression. And she observes that oppression is a social construct. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the main key here. Now, yeah. I don't know how much time we really want to spend on lucky egalitarianism. We can kind of pick out our favorite examples of like just odd claims from like the, those four main authors unless she critiques or whatever you prefer. But real, the, her main point is, again, the point of equality is to end oppression, which is a social construct. And so her version of egalitarianism is informed by that. That's the goal of it. Maybe we can do the thing where we say generally what our thoughts are about the paper. Because I don't know if this is me or the COVID talking, but I genuinely don't know wholly what I think about this paper. Like it, Overall, it has sort of a dimly positive direction, but... I kind of want to explore a lot of the ways in which she argues for her conclusions. Cause I don't even necessarily know that I disagree with her conclusions as much as the way she argues for them. But, but I, again, I don't know how much that's me talking or not. And even then, like, what exactly do you mean? Because like, do you, do you agree with her conclusions with regard to her critiques of luck egalitarianism, or do you agree mm. with her conclusions when it comes to, you know, um, you know, uh, the Democratic positive equality yeah, yeah a, exactly. equality as a capability approach instead of the yeah you know, i i think what i disagree with more i it seems and again this could change by the end of the episode because i read this you know a week ago and then covid or whatever right yeah. so <clears throat> cur currently my dim understanding is that i think i agree a lot with where she ends up but i'm not sure that her critiques of luck egalitarianism a, are always valid, but B, always kind of result in the positive proposal she puts forth. 
I, I don't know. These, these just kind of things like I'm, I'm, you know, trying to flag and table for us to like, keep in mind for my own education. That's good. Yeah, definitely. And I think I agree with half of that to the point where I don't think that her critiques in all cases necessarily prescribe her sort of perspective, right? Mm. But also, I actually, in fact, agree with the critiques themselves of like egalitarianism. Like, I pretty yeah. much agreed with all of them. I, I didn't, I think, you know, going off what Giffen was saying, I think there were largely, largely critiques of the paternalism and... Pity, that was my pity. biggest one I wanted to look at. Yeah, and kind yeah. of pity-based um, um, justification for redistribution. Mm. And I, I found those to be kind of lacking as well. Like, I, I agreed with her that I didn't think those were good justifications. And I think yeah. that that really was much of the foundation for lucky egalitarianism. So I, I kind of agree with that critique. So you know, what, you know what I thought was actually very serendipitous with this paper coming off of the moral responsibility stuff is you could largely view a lot of this debate as a very analogous conversation between different kinds of incompatibilists and compatibilists about moral responsibility, right? Like the luck, there's a way in which the luck egalitarians can split into kind of two groups almost. There's like the Galen Strawson ones, and then there's the, uh, the more optimistic ones like like you know early summers or like Dirk Paraboom um and then then there's what she kind of comes out of the wash as where uh because I mean we'll get to this but I read her prescription as not focusing so much on sort of luck in the sense that like you would focus on deterministic details but more about compatibilist mm -hmm. capabilities of people so not all of her conclusions would be satisfying to someone who's focused on you know luck and determinism and chance like she, she her solutions m wouldn't be as uh, satisfying to like a sam harris free will denier but they would be more amenable to like a compatibilist um like a you know john martin fisher harry frankfurt gary watson something like that so i, th I actually think the analogies are pretty cool between this this and the last series definitely and I'm, I'm sure i don't know if you guys had the same instincts um I mean, obviously it's in a different context. So you can't do this, but I definitely had like the slight instinct to deny or reject the dichotomy of optional and brute luck. You know what I mean? Whatever, of you know, course. Just like, I, I, there's it, margins oh, are filled sure. with that. Cause, yeah. Cause, yeah. Cause it was like, when that came up, I'm like, uh, yeah, what's the difference actually? So, yep, yep, yep. so you know, <laughs> you know, in the context of our previous discussions. So. I, of course um, I agree. Yeah. I, yeah, there's, I mean, there's, you know, there's too many margins, but there's gotta be somewhere where it's just, you know, it's all brute luck. So, somewhere yeah. I have yeah that but she, I like the fact that she kind of was like it doesn't really matter either because I mean like the luck part shouldn't be the focus yeah so she's like let's t even if there will continue to be a conversation about like that different it's tangential to equality because it doesn't yeah. matter yeah, yeah I agree which is which is good because I mean based I don't I can only assume that in like the 90s like luck egalitarianism it was just a big conversation surrounding this mm -hmm. given on how popular this paper was so it's good for her to just kind of like say all right like we need to go in this direction like yeah. enough enough of that aspect like a decade of papers on brute versus option luck is <laughs> be a little bit mind-numbing so um so she there there's two synonyms for the same view that she's critiquing right there's yeah. a quality of fortune yes and then there's luck egalitarianism and those are the same view but they go under different names yeah I, i'm guessing that like the literature I like the um, latter. Has yeah. two. <laughs> yeah, lucky egalitarianism, I think, is my preference. But basically, they the the rough definition is basically um, whether the point of equality is to compensate people for undeserved bad luck, right? Whatever yeah. that may be. Misfortune um, is her is the term she uses a lot. Right. Yes. Should you be compensated for misfortune, and is mm -hmm. that the goal of equality? Yeah. And she basically says, no, this is not really the conversation we should be having. It's about oppression, a social construct. Yeah, um, and we should also be careful. Like, we 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 don't actually know for sure that they're the same. Um, I because okay, the, yeah. the thing is, because at least close is, enough. They're they're definitely close enough, but at the same time, like, hmm. there were distinctions made about the different you know scholars that she's critiquing. Of course, where yeah. I'm not exactly sure whether they would all describe themselves yeah. as you know lucky egalitarians hmm. or 
you know, kind of um, equality of fortune. Those whatever. terms were probably <clears throat> made by these authors to distinguish within the realm That's of true. what Anderson yeah. calls luck egalitarianism, right? But That's she's true. like, they're, they're the same <clears throat> with respect to equality because they're wrong. <laughs> So that is a good point though like if you just kind of fall within lucky egalitarianism you're probably you might be a little upset if kind of just saying one or the other it, we, yeah. we might we might sound as ignorant as someone criticizing just compatibilism generally as though there weren't different types within there you know it, yeah, so, so, I, so I, blanket I apology for that yeah. Yeah, yeah no that's a good that's a really good point she um she she does say explicitly this is on page 290 that Luck egalitarianism, I thought this was, was very clear. Mm -hmm. Luck egalitarianism relies on two moral premises, that people should be compensated for undeserved misfortunes and that the compensation should come only from that part of others' good fortune that is undeserved. So the point that she's like really, really making stark there is that luck egalitarianism, as she portrays it again, because we're grossly unfamiliar with the literature but she's laying it out that it only has one lens through which to view everything and that's luck right so we should take her basic idea and i don't think she's obviously not saying that this group is advocating for equity that is like a quality of outcome but they're advocating that the parts of people's outcomes that are based on good fortune should be taken in part or probably for some of these people in whole i don't know and redistributed to people who suffer from bad luck right and that is something that she criticizes and she has this whole i mean are, are we ready to get to that section where she lays out all of the issues with it because i thought that would be interesting to go through sure sure okay so oh you know what uh, if if you would let so let's actually we need to explain the differences because she separates them because she criticizes um luck egalitarianism uh in two different kind of pillars or two different ways um because there there's two facets of it there's option luck and fortune luck or brute brute luck um so uh, where do, do you guys have a highlight of of a definition that she gives of which one? Of of both. I'm just kind of trying to get them on yeah, the table. I, I, it's on page um, 291. Oh, nice. Okay, I was on 295. 290, I believe. 291. There's, there's. I'm going to be editing out a whole lot of page finding. I'm sure, but that's that's fun. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. So I can just read from here. Um, basically, she says like all lucky egalitarians place great stress on the distinction between the outcomes for which an individual is responsible. Um, that is those that result from her voluntary choice choices and the outcomes for which she is not responsible, good or bad outcomes that occur independent of her choice or of what she would have, could have reasonably foreseen. And of mm. course those, that's the difference between option luck and brute luck. And there was some yeah. interesting, like kind of more economically oriented points about the conversion or the capacity to convert between you know, brute and option luck, which I found interesting, but I, uh, it's not really where the paper hinges on. Mm -hmm. Um, I just wanted to make a note of that just briefly, um, that it is interesting. Um, it's given me a vocabulary within economics is really my point there, but yeah, that is the difference between the two in her words. The way I was kind of reading that going back to the analogy about free will and moral responsibility is mm -hmm. the analogy there is option luck are sort of the things that are within your local control. And then brute luck are the things that aren't even in your local control, even though, of course, for like listeners who are familiar with the previous episodes, local control will collapse into absolute determinism plus randomness. We can give some examples. Yeah. Like, I, yeah. I think the one that she gives is basically if you have the option to like purchase insurance for something and you, you know, you have that just choice yes. in front of you, you can choose yes or no. And there will be a luck component to that outcome but you had the choice, which would make it optional luck. Exactly. Brute luck is something seemingly like I was born without a left foot. Like, or like a genetic I, I predisposition to cancer or something. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. It yeah, wasn't right. brought on be, by It didn't be congenital. Right. Yeah. 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 So those are the, the kind of distinctions um, that she makes or that the yeah. luck egalitarians seem to have made, you know, between themselves and which, yeah. The, okay. Critique. This, this is one of my first questions. What role is that distinction? So, so, 
One thing that I understood very well from her exposition of the luck egalitarians is the role that distinction plays for them, right? Yeah. So one question that I was kind of concerned about is I'm not sure that I understand what role that distinction plays in it for her. Um, be, because I, sh- I should like motivate that question a little bit more, I guess. Okay, so I, I take it that the luck egalitarians have that distinction as a resource in bracketing types of redistribution that we should be in favor of, right? So you can say they're like, I, I'm assuming we all get the intuition that like, let's just start with the easiest cases. Brute luck is something that extremely sucks, right? And it, and it should be sort of extremely counteracted because it it sucks so badly, right? So people who are sort of born, I don't know. No legs. Yeah, like no legs or something, right? Like that, that sucks way worse than some bad outcome of option luck for, for yeah. most cases. So, well, I... I, I mean, I, I think it, it's not that it, it, I, I think it's better to kind of view it through the luck egalitarian framework, right? Because mm. it, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to say one's, you know, better or worse, but you're right. From, yeah. from their perspective, and this is like Workin's perspective, right? The government functions as an insurance mm. pretty much. So, and in his framework, if people were to take out insurance for types of congenital oh, yeah, kind yeah. Of abnormalities, then, you know, the, the government is pretty much the, it, it, the government is the I insurer can, against. Yeah. So it kind of like, yeah. it, it, it will, the, the words not appearing to me here, but sort of like, uh, would you take out insurance against COVID brain fog if you could? If you could? Yeah. How does this no and suffers the consequences? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Giffen suddenly converts to, to, to brute egalitarian. Yeah, I, can, I can make some comments on my thoughts on the egalitarian view or the yeah, luck yeah, egalitarian yeah, view. Yeah, there you go ahead. I, I can't even think of the exact word that I want to say. If you think but... of it, bring it up. It might be in the paper as well. But basically what I gather is, again, there's a spectrum within luck egalitarianism, but basically the distinction... Um, for them is though it the distinction between option and brute luck is that you know it helps you identify the claimants of um Mm. redistribution right you know and also the magnitude right because they describe like this component should be taken from those who are lucky in order to compensate those who are not lucky um and whether or not you were lucky in the right way so that's Mm -hmm. kind of like the point of that distinction um Again, there's a spectrum within there about like the claimant and the recipient or the, the claimant of the redistribution and like the those who are being, you know, taken from. Basically, all I said was Anderson doesn't really think it's relevant, but it may, you know, place maybe it plays some role in a mm. kind of sub kind of uh, subordinate way. You know, like it may be useful in some aspect, but it's not the it's not the goal and it's not going to be and importantly, it's not going to determine claimants in her eyes at least yes in an ideal sense at least i have a question right. and the main oh yeah of course okay because what you just said is perfect perfect tabling for it and some of this is hard to answer before we actually get to her work but let's not be like too worried about that okay of course how okay one thing that i thought that luck egalitarianism conserves nicely and mm-hmm. i don't know how her view conserves this is okay the distinction between option luck and brute luck to me kind of looks like I'm sorry to keep using the analogy, but like compatibilist, or I'm sorry, um, distinctions that incompatibilists can make based on consequentialist concerns, right? So if you think about it, yeah, everything is brute luck all the way down. Like no one chose all of the predispositions that they have, but we live in a world in which you get to exercise option luck, right? Or or Mm -hmm. choices which lead to option luck or not, Right. right? So it seems, it seems really, really, I, I get pulled by the intuition that it actually in a deep sense does make a lot of sense for us to try to cancel out the obscene differences in brute luck while still kind of maintaining the ability for people to 
win or lose for lack of better terms in terms of option luck, which they get to enact, right? This is almost like, I'm almost kind of channeling like social democracy, right? Where we sort of want that mix between uh, the best of capitalism and the best of socialist ideas, right? So like, I understand and agree with how a luck egalitarian could conserve that distinction. But if you're trying to cancel out sort of social, um, if you're trying to cancel out social oppression and allow people to um, exert or kind of express their capabilities, it, maybe I'm actually discovering that you need to conserve both of these. And I'm wondering if that's why I found the paper slightly inconvincing in both directions. Like, do, do, so I get, so, I get the So you basically think that it should be important, the distinction there. In terms I, of policy, it sounds like. Specifically I do. Because theoretically, obviously, there's no deep distinction metaphysically. Of course. Yeah. Sure. I don't think anyone, I don't even, I don't think Anderson has a problem <laughs> with that claim, and I don't think we do. So. That would have been fun if there was like a, a like a second contrast. I feel like the libertarian, whatever the libertarian in the free will sense would have been for the, <laughs> like, I guess they would just be, actually, liber- actually libertarians would probably be libertarians. <laughs> Uh, it's all too natural. <laughs> that that would I, you know, like it's like it's 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 all you the market, sin like, in your in your past life. <laughs> yeah, like Observe that you know, congenital guess, disease. And I also get it like it depends like what you might conserve some elements of like option luck. Like what if someone like you know doesn't pick up health insurance, mm-hmm. right? Like under our current system, like yeah, like, I, I don't want to be saying that everything boils down to both. Like, I think that that's where her critique of yes. luck egalitarianism was, was accurate. But, yeah. But it seems to me that there are also really true distinctions. Like I'm, I'm not saying well, that's why it's not in every area. That's why she says like to be a, kind of like an equal citizen. We're not trying to kind of mm-hmm. equalize every aspect. Right? Yeah. Well, yeah. I don't know that that was necessarily so I don't know if this is but, but of- actually, well, let, me, let me make this last point. I think she's just trying to say that some things are outside the purview of the dichotomy of option and brute luck, right? Like mm-hmm. some things are, can't even be looked at through that lens Yeah, where it's um, whether, whether you kind of arrived at this poor position through brute luck or option luck, mm-hmm. we're going to treat you the same. So, yeah. 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 So Jordan, I don't know if this is from later in the paper, but I don't know if this kind of was an example that kind of highlighted your re- reaction, but she mentions the example of like the flooding insurance um, yeah. because people have some degree of choice as to where they, you know, dwell. Oh and yeah. If yeah. you, if you live like on the coast in a hurricane prone area, the likelihood is clearly higher. And you know that in advance, you can assume that adults at least you That's know, optional are, luck, are aware. Yeah. So that would be an example of optional luck, which some lucky galantarians would say like, well, they did have the choice. It was optional luck, not brute luck. And therefore that, like, it was like know, help should be, should be like, um, it, she, no, she, cho- she chose like this particularly heinous. Um, <laughs> what, what, what was that person? Rick Radigowski or something. Uh, Rakowski. Yeah. Rakowski. Where is this? Uh, well, just throughout the paper, remember, she, she contrasted her view to Rakowski and Rakowski was like, he or she, I don't remember, was was, partic- oh. was particularly brutal. <laughs> like, Oh, no, she actually says like, this may seem brutal, I think at one point to, to um, I, I was like, me. I was like, is this really uh, here, here? I will say this. I, I did think that there was a bit of straw manning or at least attacking the lowest common denominator by her in, in, I mean, there were pages upon pages upon like of combating Rakowski's view. And I was like, well, yeah, but like, but, but Rakowski's view is monstrous. <laughs> I had the reaction too. And that's where I, I said this in the group chat is that it started to scream 1999 to me because of the context in which it was being written. Okay. So post-Soviet collapse was just the capitalist glory age because there was no competition mm. to the model. So this is of course where like views like Rakowski's would have like gotten like legitimate, you know, viewership. <laughs> right. So like it, it's unfortunate yeah. if it was like two years later after the dot-com like crash or like after especially like um the great recession this wouldn't have like she wouldn't have needed to address it because it would have seemed monstrous r- r- the r- fact that, that it was like the time needed to be dedicated it i don't think it's a slight against anderson i think it's a slight against the circumstances i just thought that it was view. like it was like oh, he, that was what a monstrous <laughs> view <laughs> it was like it was like okay 
not many readers will, will read Rakowski and be sympathetic to that view. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I think actually a lot of people were at the time though. That's the horrifying thing. Sure, but but I'm talking about I'm talking about you know within the reasonable area of the spectrum. <laughs> like it, it... Here, here's here's one of his better takes here. <laughs> so consider an, an un, uninsured driver who negligently makes an illegal turn that causes an accident with another car. Witnesses call the police reporting who was at fault. The police transmit this information to emergency medical technicians. When they arrive at the scene and find the driver is at fault, is uninsured, they leave him to die by the side of the road. (laughs) According to Rakowski's doctrine, this action is just, where they have no obligation to give him emergency care. No doubt, there are sound policy reasons for not making snap judgments on a personal responsibility at the scene of emergency. But uh, What does she call that problem? (laughs) Yeah, she, she, she was like, like that's it was like the snap decision problem or something it was like <laughs> I, I, I do like that she... abandonment of negligent victims uh, yeah i mean that that's just a good example like i don't know how i don't know how rakowski sleeps at night i, I was like so i just <laughs> so thought absurd. i thought okay it's not exactly the most <laughs> prideful way to put forth your argument to contrast it to something so poor as Rakowski's, right? So like I, I take it so here's the here I take it that because, because like Rakowski as I was reading him or her through Anderson is like essentially that you know that that kind of bastard for lack of a better word who's saying like well yeah, you're you're get you're dealt the cards, but it's all how you play them as they like sit you know, sit in their <laughs> mansion. Like <laughs> yeah it's like unable to move. It's like, okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, but your ability to play the cards you're dealt is also a card. Like, those people seem to always forget that, right? Yeah, of course. Okay. I I take it that the luck egalitarian of a reasonable type has opened to them the motivation that I was kind of poorly phrasing earlier, where you can be motivated to, it's sort of like, like brute luck is the thing that's the most egregious, right? We want to eliminate bad brute luck Mm-hmm. Uh, that's our top priority, but a second, but a second priority that we could have is also eliminating bad option luck um, that is kind of maladaptive to society or something, right? So, like, um, what's a good example? Like, we we okay, here's like a good example, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it's bad option luck to uh, get caught up in a Ponzi scheme. Or to make it a real world example, packaging bad um, uh, housing loans, right? Like it was ca- in the 2008 crash, you know what I mean? It's, it's bad option luck to kind of end up at uh, whatever the, you know, the firms where the names are escaped me, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, but, but that person should starve on the street also, right? So it's like, I just thought she straw manned um, what the best of, the luck egalitarians could do we're saying like look all, all we're using this distinction for is to prioritize levels of luck that we want to eliminate right like the first well, kind of I, 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 well, yeah I, I i would i just wouldn't go that far i mean like she explicitly states like okay here's one end of the spectrum this is the hard line yeah. Rakowski, right and yeah, then yeah. She, i i honestly thought she kind of grappled with dworkin the most who's like mm-hmm. i mean he's nyu professor of law and philosophy so it's like very yeah. reasonable position yeah so yeah 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 big 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 voice right in the field so rakowski i feel like was more like a benchmark like okay here's one extreme and here are other views people what, what, sa- sanity check for me did did she address that concern at all that i that i made did i miss that in the paper like i, I genuinely i could have well, missed I, it. I think it's kind of like a broad stroke kind of thing is that she it's not that she doesn't think that luck egalitarians can address those like differences it's that she doesn't think that's the point of egalitarianism yeah. i think i think she, okay, i think okay. within i think within her system she there is a place for such a difference mm-hmm. um perhaps i don't know that for See, sure especially when okay, it comes to that's practical what i want to explore yeah. when it comes to practical policy things which she touches on the least yeah. um uh like in in reality not under like ideal situations mm-hmm. i'm sure mm-hmm. that there is a place for something like that yeah um, and, when, when you're and, constrained and you're so, right that the paper is trying to answer the question of the title, which is what is the point of equality? So exactly. she's, trying to, she's trying to ground it. She, she's looking at so, the grounding first. Yeah, yeah, I don't think she's saying, like, I mean, the 
she doesn't like spend any time talking about like the benefits really of like egalitarianism. Yeah, I'm sure yeah. she would agree there are some, but she says like mm-hmm. I've identified these problems from this you know decent spectrum of elect egalitarians, and these um, problems I've identified identified yeah suggest some desires of a egalitarian um, theory. Mm-hmm. I'm going to use that information and then construct one. Um, so so I, again, I think I don't know what you would actually say to like what is the role of brute and option luck in your like democratic equality she may say like it's like a tertiary you know quaternary thing that mm-hmm. only kind of comes into play whenever you're in the real world and like have to make decisions like you don't have like the full resources you have to mm-hmm. prioritize find a hierarchy of you know distribution things like that like that's where i she would she would nest it if she does value it i would guess okay that's interesting. I'm realizing it's probably better listening if we actually get her problems with luck egalitarianism on the table and raise hers, and then we can kind of get a little bit more into like, I guess, a lot of the questions I, I seem to have. Sure. Okay. One of the problem is that she identified like so many problems over so many pages, like so individually lot, for luck yeah. egalitarianism. I do. I mean, I'm well, guessing. Let, let's point out the good that. ones here. I was going to say, let's. <laughs> I can. I can take care of all the editing. Let's. Let's look at some of the best ones. Because I thought a lot of these were actually really good. Because uh, there's... Yeah, you pick out your favorite, really. Well, I'm just reading. Uh, there's discrimination among the disabled, but I don't remember that one. Uh, we can... No, that, that one's not great. Okay. Well, there's the one that Giffen already talked about, the geographical discrimination among citizens. So that essentially, that, that is a good one. And Giffen already said that. That was if you foolishly, you know, um, uh, move to New Orleans and then don't prepare for the flooding that's going to occur. That that's yeah, the government's just going to walk by and go option luck, option <laughs> luck, and let you drown. Well, Rakowski's government would. Right, right. right. I don't think. Yeah, I don't think it's <laughs> yeah, fair to say the luck of course. Of course. Yeah. Rakowski's government. <laughs> what, what a snake! <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, uh, pure oppression. <laughs> I I don't know. I just really thought like how you know R- Rakowski's view has got to be popular amongst the coldest hearts out there. I mean, but, but like nothing but the deepest, darkest conservatives <laughs> would yeah. agree. Well, I, I I appreciated the uh, the problem of vulnerability of dependent caretakers. Oh, I like that one too. Re- that one's actually yeah. critical because yeah. that one directly informs. And that was her, her best point. Kind of that. Yeah. What, what page is that? Do you have that? Two ninety. Yeah, but it but it co- oh. spills out of two ninety seven. Do you want to go over that briefly? Yeah. Well, okay. I'll just read a little bit from her. Um, she says children are not responsible either for their parents' luck of wealth or for their parents' decision to reproduce. Thus, it is a matter of bad brute luck requiring compensation if their parents lack the means to give them their fair share. But the women who devote themselves to caring for children are another story, since women are not on average less talented than men, but choose to develop and exercise talents that command little or no market wage. It is not clear whether luck egalitarians have any basis for remedying the injustices that attend their dependence on male wage earners call this the problem of vulnerability of the dependent caretakers which is an excellent problem yeah this is where her kind of feminine ethics uh, mm. comes into play I, I know that that is one of the fields which she specializes in but yeah. this one touches on it only kind of um briefly which is a good one actually like it's not it, one that i would great, think of yeah it's a great point yeah. i mean it it's um it's and now it's um sorry um just very close to um, another point that she makes about like the distinction between like the economy and those who are engaged in market like yes, activity, yes. which is another good one. But I think that's more and of that, a positive claim section. And that, that comes out in her exercising of capabilities as the main view through which to view these things, not um because she because she does we haven't really talked about this, but she she accuses the luck egal- egalitarians of only being able to view things in terms of luck as the inputs, but then the outputs as monetary, narrowly, but larger sort of material, um, you know, gains or losses and resources. Yeah. And I don't know that all the luck egalitarians were like that, but she did yeah. seem to think that it was like a main through point. And, and can I say, so that my my question that we, we will circle back to, because again, I don't want to discuss it now, but it arose from kind of sentences like she said, it is not clear whether luck like, egalitarians have any basis for remedying the injustices that attend these issues, right? That, that was what I was saying before with like, 
I, I kind of think that this is like a view of the worst luck egalitarians, because I think there's a really straightforward way in which you could be a luck egalitarian, but through just like really kind of basic consequentialist concerns, it would be pretty obvious to see why, even from a luck egalitarian perspective, we should, we should compensate, you know, the vulnerability of dependent caretakers. But we, I mean, we can circle back to that, but I just, I was going to say like, sentences like that are what well I the vulnerability i think the point she was making is that maybe not all but some lucky egalitarians would identify like you know you made the choice to be a dependent caretaker rakowski. and that no, i mean i mean, that might even be more than just rakowski that might be like sure or, sure or yeah. something a lot or of people van, van Paris. like a lot of people would say that yeah no like little le- le- legitimately that's the pro- yeah problem she identifies there. Is, like, they made research. the choice to do this put themselves in a vulnerable position for their entire lives therefore it is they are not a claimant of mm-hmm, distribution mm-hmm. so is some version of lucky egalitarianism able to um discuss that um perhaps but i mean you really have to strain the idea of brute and option luck to have that framework apply there let's circle back to that yeah, yeah. um what were some of the other good ones exploitation <clears throat> and the lack of a safety net i don't remember if that was a good one. Oh no that, that was based on rakowski's view <laughs> yeah what did you guys think about the um the one disparages the internally disadvantaged and raises private disdain to the status of officially recognized truth uh, where basically the state is insulting you this is like 306 Three, uh, three. Oh, oh. oh just... Well, let's say let's say that now we're switching to victims of bad brute luck because we were talking about. Oh, I'm sorry. We did change sections there, but we were still within yeah. the section of critiquing. Sure, but concerned. but I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, but wait, wait, wait. Sorry. Before we get to that one, um, sure. one of her biggest and most recurring ones in her own section was the uh, uh, accusation of paternalism, of That's... of bad option luck. So. Um, uh, I don't, he argues that it's sometimes fair. <clears throat> I don't know if this is relevant or not, but I have it highlighted. Arneson has considered this problem most deeply within the terms of luck egalitarianism. He argues that it is sometimes unfair to hold people responsible for the degree to which they are responsible agents. The capacities needed for responsible choice, foresight, perseverance, calculative ability, strength of will, self-confidence are partly a function of genetic endowments. And particular, and partly of the good fortune of having decent parents. So, thus, the imprudent are entitled to paternalistic protection by society against their poor choices. Ch- you know, channel the Sam Harris free will denier here. You know, um, <clears throat> so she says that that is a problem, and she labels that as paternalism, which is sort of. You know, you could summarize it as as overprotection and regulation for people's best interests. And she says that the state, I'm, I'm, you know, I take it that her critique is um, it doesn't. And this is where she kind of has the prelude to her view. This is wrong as a policy prescription because it fails to express respect for recipients. Right. It's sort right, of this is, it's, it's, it ties it's, back. I'm sorry, Jordan. No, 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 no. Yeah. I, I was gonna. I think I'm on a very slight lag. Um, I was oh, gonna really? say this ties back to her view of like the point of equality being, you know, social in nature. Is that it is um, a? I don't know if she would call it oppression necessarily, but the disrespect mm. that is given is a form of social inequality, and therefore it falls under the purview of what equality, you know, or is it's a target for you know these equality prescriptions. That makes sense. Yeah, no, and, and, and I think it's also just trying to kind of like skew the framing or like kind of change the framing of how one could argue for equality, right? Because like I, I, I like this line. However, in their view, and they are in this case as lucky egalitarians, only paternalistic reasons can justify making mandatory the various universal social ins- insurance programs characteristic of modern welfare states like social security health and disability insurance and so Mm. on so things like you know the argument might have gone before reading this paper why why do we have social security and you're like well you know some even though it's not a lot of money that people get you know after they retire some people just won't you know save for their retirement 
So in fact, we do need this, even though you yourself could actually use that money better, right? You could put that, that money you would otherwise be putting, you know, for um, social security taxes, you could put that into some sort of growth fund, a right? Higher, and, yeah, return. And, and, yeah. and you'd make more money as a result of that. Yeah. But okay, but we tax you, we tax everyone so that no one is mm. completely broke after retirement, right? Yeah. Or uh, during retirement, I suppose. But, <laughs> no, it's but after <laughs> retirement. <laughs> we shan't but send a beggar to money. the grave. Yeah. You know, so so it's it, it is sort of like paternalistic logic in that sense, where it's like yeah, and it's paternalistic some... to both sides, right? Because it's paternalistic, sort of negatively to the people who could do better, and positively, I don't mean in a good sense, but like in the sense of you're too stupid to do it for yourself, so we're going to make you do it to protect yourself. Exactly. So, and the thing is, and it's not that um, that logic isn't like necessarily true, mm. right? Because it's, I mean, like history bears that out, right? Like, didn't, <laughs> yeah. didn't elderly poverty drop in half after like social yeah, security was passed? Because you know a what lot I mean? of people are pretty dumb. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because people just like wouldn't save on their own throughout their lives. Mm -hmm. So you could make this argument, but that's not going to be appealing to everyone. Yeah. Right. Like someone who's just like honestly, I. I, why, why, why take away my money? Like, I, I, because the thing is, could Rogan. I, well, well, the thing is, <laughs> why I mean, take my money? I mean, well, I mean we like, know people who are like this. I mean, you know, our one friend from high school is probably like this. Why save, you know, money for anything in the future? Yeah. And also, like, what about, like, um, what, I mean, like, I, I think there are, like, obviously good ways to respond to this, but, like, what if someone said, well, couldn't I just invest my money wisely and then, you know, just be a better benefactor in, in my older age to provide for people who... Like that's going to you know, happen. <laughs> yeah, like I could what, be a who, better provider for the issues you're trying to address. Exactly. Like what, what if they are could. that kind of person though? Yeah. You're like, okay, yeah. well, yeah, you alone can't solve all these issues, right? And they're like, yeah, but maybe people like me would be more willing to solve these issues if you didn't have some sort of system in place that mm. already, you know, half solved these issues. I don't know. I, I, mm -hmm. I don't know exactly how the conversation would go, but the point is though, like she's trying to change the dialogue a little bit with like the arguments that Here's, underlie. This is something I want to return to because I actually wonder if the very concerns of paternalism reemerge in more covert ways in her prescription. That would be interesting. Um, uh, that was one question that I wanted to kind of discuss. But again, like I, I do think for like listening sake, I think it's better to actually get some of like her details on the table first. Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay. Um, distinguish between, yeah, okay, let's move on from that. Okay, uh, uh, any, any victims of bad brute luck that we wanted to talk about? If you had, well, yeah, I, I had asked yeah. you if you had any interesting thoughts on like the one... Um, basically where the state do i have any interesting thoughts that might be up to you to determine <laughs> basically did you think it was like a viable critique that she was giving or do you think the issue of like I, this is actually pretty closely related to the paternalism but basically um this is, here's the quote about she's kind of like saying that this is what in a egalitarian framework they the state is saying to those who are you know benefiting from whatever welfare program she says to the disabled your defective native endowments or current disabilities, alas, make your life less worth living than the lives of normal people. And then mm -hmm. she goes on and gives other examples. Did you mm -hmm. think that was like a valid critique? Do you think that there's something inherent there? And Jordan, this may be something you bring up later when we get to her positive prescriptions. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. So, so, but I think for the listeners, we should, we should, she's saying that that's a, this was on 306? 305 and 306. Yeah. Yeah. I took it that this critique was also kind of the, lack of respect or paternalism paternalization side because she right. she Absolutely. called it it uh she says equality of fortune disparages the internally disadvantaged and raises private disdain to the status of officially recognized truth okay yeah this was one this was one that i thought was kind of like an interesting one and one you have to be really careful about because okay. because you don't because like there's a concern of you don't you don't want to be 
you know, like the charged word for it is ableist, right? So you don't want to say like it's objectively. So, so here's the claim that I don't think that you have to be committed to as a luck egalitarian. You sure. don't have to say the life of someone in a wheelchair is worth less than the life of someone who's not a wheelchair, right? Like that, that's like the reductio view, like that, mm. you know, like, like who knows, Rakowski might believe that. For <laughs> it, it, it is. <laughs> Rakowski joins the Zoom call <laughs> post haste. <laughs> <laughs> Right. So I don't think, I don't think you have to say that, but I think, but I don't, um, but okay. But here's the view that I think I would be willing to defend. And I don't know if this makes me a luck egalitarian or not, but, but I, but I think like if you abstract it, right. Hmm. Generally speaking, there are more things that someone who has function over their legs can do than someone who doesn't. Right. Okay. So like in what course, like that's an obvious claim right so no one would really well no i can't phrase it like that hold on i gotta figure out how to phrase it i mean you cancel i'm not really concerned i'm I'm actually just trying to be like specific <laughs> yeah of course because there's there's like a really cheap version of this that i don't want to make and then there's the like the deeper version that i think is maybe more accurate um okay here's what i want to say given the ability Okay, here's here's what it is. This debate actually came up. This is a real life debate. Remember, um, there was sort of a we developed a scientific you know ability to not cure deafness, maybe cure deafness. I don't remember right, but but there was a technology and a and a procedure. I don't know any of the details where sure. we could essentially make some babies born with certain types of deafness equivalent to people who could hear naturally, right? Of course. So. I think that it would be heinous not to, you know, let's bracket other concerns. It might be too much money, whatever, right? Like, let's say this, that procedure is a dollar. I think that it would be starkly immoral to not pay that dollar to have your deaf baby. Uh, as the parent or as the state? Either. Okay. That was an important distinction. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I was saying almost from like the Rawlsian kind of rational third party view. Like if you're just like, like the rational okay. third party, that it makes would sense. be like deeply immoral not to do that. That is interesting, actually. That yeah. is one thing that definitely doesn't read as um, easy, I guess I would say. Yeah. In this paper is yes. when she talks about um, specific communities of, of well, <laughs> actually, you're right. You want to be very specific when you. I know you want to be very specific. Yeah. Um, but it's not you know, certain, certain, certain <laughs> less abled communities. Even then, that's, that's clearly. What, how does she describe it, actually? I, well, I have, you know, I, I'm, I'm, also I'm the language of 1999 is, you know, different true. from today. But, but yeah, either way. I'm just wondering if that point, like, distinguishes either view, though. I feel like that's, that, that could be found within her view. It could be found within Lucky Galaxy. Well, well, no, I don't know that she does prescribe that in her view. That's, I think, what Jordan's trying to get at. Like, I think but, she but, would be okay as long as those, well, in, in the case of a baby, it's harder to say because they don't have any capacity. <laughs> but, um. As like an adult, if so, as, as long as this, <laughs> as long as the state um, makes a, a like all of these the important um, mm-hmm. uh, or the the e- democratic equality relevant aspects of you know the being a member of the community uh, accessible to the U, then you know there's no uh, the further concern directly. Well, maybe we should. I don't just... know. I I I, 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 I think that's her view. I, I do want to push back on that a little bit through like her lens of like capabilities, right? Where like she wants to leave certain avenues open that you don't necessarily have to, you know, um, make functional, right? Or you mm-hmm. know, make happen. But at least like in the context of like babies, right? Where it's like if there was some cheap procedure. I would say from her perspective, like if it That's... was like what, to, to be an equal citizen, um, I, I, I would somehow would, I, I'd have to, I, I'd have to imagine that'd be like under the umbrella of equal citizenry of like that, that would probably reach that for me. I for, don't for, know that she would agree, but I understand that it totally could for you i don't think she actually mentions like babies at all in any of her thought experiments that is a super interesting question because jordan you brought this, that this up, right? doesn't really exist you know what i mean because like I, well i would actually so the fact that you 
I think it, because it affects development, I'm curious what you would say about this. It's like by not giving it to the child, you kind of remove the the option in a way. Um, like I don't think that that's how she would look at it. Do you think? I well, just I just don't see how she could possibly disagree with that point because the thing is, well, like, I don't think that no, that's no, what she's giving us. Hang on, hang, hang on. Yeah, let, let, okay. me, let me let me make this point though. Like she talks about like in this paper how. Let me make sure I, I give this idea correctly here, mm-hmm. but she mentions that the deaf community says that, okay, it's not that we need, you know, for us to hear to like live as equal citizens, but it's that to navigate modern society, we would prefer that communication be made as easily as it is among the non-deaf community. Yeah. She said, imagine what a society would look like if everyone were deaf. And then sure. that's how accessible society should be to the deaf in our current society. Yes, but it's currently not. Yes, that's that true. Yes. So, so the idea is that if you're a member of the deaf community right now, mm-hmm. you can't act as an equal citizen entirely. Yeah. And, and in that way, you can't exercise the full range of your capabilities, which is the basis of her. Right. Uh, yeah. So I'd have to imagine yeah. if it was like a child, for like a cheap procedure one way or the other, I have to imagine to like leave a child open to the full range of its capabilities. Yeah. I feel like you need to give the child the procedure. I, I don't know. So but, the reason why I raised that is because the way I'm looking at this debate, right? She's, she's asking the question, what is the core value at the bottom of equality, right? Right. What, like that's the title of the paper. What's the point of equality? It's unclear to me and maybe Giffen, you might know that maybe either of you might know this. She, she, okay. So I think the one thing that's obvious is that she says the kind of capabilities approach or the, or the equal respect approach. I, I don't know what the term for it is, but that, the exercising of capabilities uh, is the core value of hers, right? Does she say, uh, this is something that I just don't know about. And this is like, I don't know how my critique goes because is she saying that that's the core value or is she saying that's like the only value? She's, she's not saying it's the only value, right? But I don't, I don't know. I think she, I, she would claim if I'm reading this correctly, the core value in egalitarianism either is or ought be yeah. ending oppression. And then she extrapolates from there, like if, since oppression is socially imposed, it's about creating a community of equals. And then from there is where you get like the further concerns. It, so I think that's kind of like the core there, which obviously doesn't address any like luck at all, which is well, the, the difference. Well, the, see, that's the problem. I, I guess I kind of had with the structure of this paper is, she, uh, she seems to critique luck egalitarianism mm-hmm. on the basis of believing that that's the only value, not the core value. A lot of her critique seems to be aimed at the people who think that that's the only value because she raises exceptions. Um, or, 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 okay, let's, let's abstract it a little bit. You could say, we don't have to think about like what specific people think, but, we're, but she might want to, fr- or we could phrase the debate as, okay, if this is your value, what do you get? What, what does that value logically give you, right? And if mm. this is your value, what does that logically give you, right? Yeah. So here's what I think is like, I don't know, but I think it's missing from this paper. She rightly points out that if uh, luck egalitarianism is your only value, then it results in these problems. And we've talked about some of those already, right? But then she doesn't put, I don't think she fairly puts forth her own view as if, The expression of capabilities is your only value. What does that logically get you? She seems to sort of open it up as the core value, but not the only value while attacking luck egalitarianism under the guise of if this is your only value, not your core value. I, I, were you, I'm sorry, I'm not sure I fully grasped, but maybe this doesn't address your question, but I think she does kind of say, to her own like democratic <clears throat> equality, like the this is what you get with it as your only value. I think she does say that. Okay. I mean, I mean if she that's, have... well, no, that's important. If if that's what she says, then I have different problems with it. Cause then I think she actually imports like a she she brings in a lot of things 
mm, implicitly then i think she may that's a good point i don't know that for sure but i again i think it's not that necessarily like <clears throat> in terms of all values and just like as individuals or as a society she's specifically critiquing egalitarianism yeah like the the root of egalitarianism was this current literature is mm -hmm. about this for whatever reason and so it seems like this is an entire conversation within the scope of yeah. a value not necessarily ah, like yes. all like she's saying there i mean it, it might be true that a lucky egalitarian might hold other values that would kind of prop up their yeah, theory yeah. but she's saying you know if the point of mm -hmm. egalitarianism is to end oppression their you know lucky egalitarianism doesn't do that even if other of their values would you know help patch patch together yeah that's, that's how i'm reading this i think i think may i understand very well import other things i think i understand the current state of my criticism with the paper then which sure. is good which is good because like because again my current understanding might change by the end of the episode but like but i but i think that my current criticism is yeah she rightly points out that if you're sort of a deontologist about luck egalitarianism so you're not allowed to import concerns about anything else then yeah you're rightly going to have serious problems like the ones we've talked about right um but she doesn't make it clear at least that because i i don't know I, it's it's an open question to me whether the more pluralistic luck egalitarian can create just as good an outcome it, and I, and maybe conserves some things that like her theory can't, it, I don't know. I, I think, I think she just, she criticizes. That might be a, like, if we find a good response to this paper, we might be able to see what like lucky egalitarians are able to do that she isn't. Cause obviously she doesn't say like, oh crap, well, mine doesn't do this. Well, I thought I raised that like a, like a potential one for that. You raised a potential what? Um, a potential example of where, where luck egalitarians could do that, but she wouldn't. Um, it, am I completely what, blanking? Dude, the, the more sad thing is I'm blanking on it. You know, um, on your example? Yeah. On it my was own the ex example about like, um, you know, like a small amount of money being paid for like deaf children to hear. Uh, like deaf I, I don't know if that was that example. Was, I, yeah, I don't think that was because we kind of discussed that. Maybe Adam, you actually raised the point that she probably would argue for the hearing. I'm not actually sure about that. After maybe I was conversation. I'm yeah. actually not sure about that. She would because yeah. One of the um, things that makes it difficult to address that question is that she very most of this paper discusses kind of like in ideal situations, and mm -hmm. she doesn't really say what to do in our various failings as a society to reach her you know her goal. Giffen, like, why don't why don't you just why don't we just talk about what her view is so that we don't have to keep kind of dancing around it? I think that's a good thing to do. Because like just kind of going off real quickly here though, because yeah. one of the reasons that I'm, is actually what Giffen was just talking about um, makes me think in fact she might not actually kind of subscribe to a position where the state intervenes to um, <laughs> yeah. prevent deafness in children. Is she does mention that deaf individuals seem to have the same spectrum of happiness and fulfillment in their lives and that any problems they do experience are actually due to, due like to Giffen oppression. said, oppression. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And, and that's actually... It's and I disagree not, with that view. And it's not yeah. the deafness itself that we should target, but the oppression. So mm. I actually kind of go back and uh, I, don't, I, don't, it, I don't think she... That is one of the definitely the most contentious yeah. points um and, of and, her framework and like it, well, it, it's okay. very interesting you see the, the conflicting values here is like the the respect to all individuals but also the practical reality and how that informs your view yeah i, I think i do get her perspective though because it's like i mean consider this like none of us are as smart as an individual like stephen hawking right yeah but, but Jordan it, B. Peterson. <laughs> <laughs> Jordan, <laughs> none me, of us are Dr. quite Rogan. Dr. Jordan B. Peterson. Yeah, so, yeah. Editor, yeah. clean that up. It was doctor all along. <laughs> but but like having like the fact that we aren't as smart as those, you know, whatever individual you want to kind of just put out there is sort of like the paragon of modern intelligence or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. But but like 
<laughs> Peterson. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I, I All too you. easy. I messed you up. Continue. Yeah. But um, I, I think we don't think our lives are, are necessarily like, you know, miserable to live, even though we don't. I mean, I, maybe if we were to kind of like switch between those two perspectives, yeah. suddenly coming back to just like, you know, a, uh, a, 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 you know, some intelligence that's within the, the regular spectrum, like regardless Flowers of how the, smart the, the all no, things no considered one, approach. Yeah. Yes. No one on this podcast is a genius. Okay. Yeah. So <laughs> like, especially not this episode. <laughs> yeah. No, this episode is a disaster, but, <laughs> no, but oh, everyone on this podcast is quite smart, but no one here is a true genius. No. But, but what would that be like, right? Exactly. We, but we don't know, obviously. Of so, course. but we don't think our lives miserable. Just, but just knowing that there is a exactly. kind of a higher level of perceiving the world. So that is perfect I, example. I, I do understand her perspective in that sense that <sighs> deaf people don't know what they're missing in that sense. So the mm. real problem is like, you know, is the way in which those people suffer as a result of yes uh, yes you know, wait uh, yeah can. oh oh i remember my example now you, you made me yeah. it was it was exactly like this so okay basically here was my reductio to her view right she is unable to it was exactly the point you're making adam except it was just a personality trait like i was saying okay. i was I, I i wrote down like okay what if someone just had like a, a greater ability for love, right? Or like compassion or just to kind of like, you know, like be, be compassionate in that Buddhist sense, right? That is something that we don't currently have access to, but it would be a better existence if we had it. And no one, you can't cash out the fact that we don't have that ability to feel deeper love in terms of oppression, right? It's yeah. just luck. There are people, you know, the ability to feel or express any genetic uh, or, or I'm sorry, any personality trait is going to come down to genetics plus randomness, right? So it's all brute luck in that sense. And then option luck as you choose to either kind of develop that or not, right? So that is an example that is outside the purview of the value of eliminating oppression, right? Um, yeah. But it's one that could be conserved by the luck egalitarian. So what does she do with that? I mean, the problem from my perspective is she would have to regress to the capabilities approach thing, right? But well, then I don't think she but but my point oh, yeah, sorry, sorry. but my point was gonna be, but then capabilities are getting cashed out in luck terms. So then it's actually so so I, I don't I think that her view is a really important value, but I don't know if I would make it my core value. I, I think that like- Certainly you know, not your only. Well, well, but I wouldn't make anything my only. I mean, in terms of like, right. a, you know what I mean? If I had Patron. to guess- <laughs> Patron is my core value. Lust. <laughs> what, I, what I think she would say to that example, Jordan, about the empathy is she says, that has no role to play in equality. In egalitarianism, I, 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 and then I they, totally the conversation would be over. I she would might totally then say, disagree with that. Then she, she would, she would then say, think... "You can invoke other things in order to like argue for it, but it just wouldn't be from a." I, I, mean, I think that that's but, a mistake Jordan, of the status quo bias. Don't you think? No, no, Jordan. Oh, okay. Hang on, because yeah. because like the way I view this is like, and give me a second to actually kind of get out these ideas. But it almost seems like you're like describing a situation in which the entire bell-shaped curve is like shifted one direction or the other where like like the population at large like regardless of like the millions of different attributes they have if we could maximize like just like love and compassion in people at large i think she would you know approve of that right no but but but, but it's the idea mm -hmm. that there are differences in people now that we're mm -hmm. trying to rectify right so so the thing yeah. is like so um, I think it'd be close, like a closer example would be, okay, there are differences in people, you know, like, like you said, in compassion, which mm -hmm. could lead to like better lives. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in the context of this conversation, the question could be, do we compensate those with less compassion who live more miserable lives as a result? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Rather yeah. than like, you know, bringing everybody to that level. Mm -hmm. yeah. So 
I, it sounds like a more reasonable example there? of I, the... I actually do. Um, my question is, on what basis is she able to say we should bring everyone up? Because like, I, because her whole discussion of the deaf community made me question whether she would say that or not. Because, because doesn't that seem... So, oh, okay. That seemed to me... So, so that was my other like stem of the critique is... She criticizes luck egalitarianism as being extremely paternalistic. I think paternalism, if her view is to end up as a reasonable one, has to creep back in because of exactly... Where exactly? uh, In the sense that uh, to allow people to maximize the expression of their capabilities, we actually do have to be paternalistic in some ways, right? So... um, I'm asking you for that example well yeah so i was about to um so with adam's example where you know (laughs) what no we're we're just off tonight (laughs) because because of the uh covid brain here like like the conversations we're having are having right now are just like very uh i know it's gonna take a lot of editing yeah very very stunted so yes yeah i agree um probably also due to the like the length of the paper but true um damn i love uh, what was i saying you were so, gonna give the example so adam's example of people can be on various parts of the spectrum of compassion right yep. and that's brute luck what you're born with and then the option luck is kind of how that cashes out in terms of you know do you use that to better your life or, or worsen it right mm-hmm. um Adam said that, and this was, this would be a reasonable decision if we could bring people up, if there was some $10 genome fix for people on the really low end of compassion to bring them up, we should do that. And Adam thought she would do that too. Now, here's my problem. I think she should do that because I think that that's the only reasonable thing to do, right? But to do that is extremely paternalistic in, in saying we think that this type of life is not as valuable or is not as good a life as one in this range of the compassion scale, right? And we have good reasons to think that. So what we're going to do is, you know, for those people born with a, a lack of empathy or lack of compassion, we're going to bring them up to our level. That's an extremely paternalistic thing to do, but I think rightly so. So she paints paternalism as something to be avoided at all costs. And I'm disagreeing with that. And I'm saying that if her view doesn't then bring some paternalism back in, um, it's actually a pretty unreasonable view. I'm just wondering, like her critique of paternalism, like, does it relate specifically to like adults? Because I I think there's like an idea. I think she does. Because yeah, because like, it's like, okay. I, I don't know if she would be against paternalistic behavior for infants, right? Like that's, that's our job as, you know, you know, adult members of mm-hmm. society to make those decisions and say, actually, hey, there's this new technology that would bring new members into this world with just, in, you know, high levels of compassion that will lead to better lives for them. I just, that would be paternalistic behavior toward the unborn, can I ask Which, a okay, follow-up question then? Let's not talk about what we would do, but let, just, just in terms of pure valuing then. So, okay, as adults, like, you know, there's been the brute luck and the expression of option luck at this point, right? Yeah. Some of, there's obviously a spectrum of compassion for adults. Excuse me, in purely value terms, I am still v- extremely reasonable or um, I'm... <laughs> Jesus. Good to know. I am still, and, and you will be too, if only you agree. <laughs> Jesus. Oh, that brain fog is just hammering me right now. I think that it is objectively true to say that people with a deficit of compassion live objectively worse lives than people in the normal to higher range, right? Like, for instance, in like a Frank Ferdian sense, I would give myself a shot if it raised my compassion level by 10%, right? And I think that I would be wrong 
to not have enough compassion to even get that decision off the ground. Can her view... So what I'm saying is like she chastises paternalism from the luck egalitarian perspective. But I think that her view actually entails just as much in the, in the expression of people's capabilities, but she doesn't want to do that. But I think she either has to like sneakily put that back into her view or it's actually really unreasonable. I guess I didn't understand your perspective there. Like it cause I guess clarify for me on this point, like, okay. are you saying Okay, so there's going to be some segment of the population as adults, Mm -hmm. if the shot were available to raise their compassion, they in fact wouldn't get the shot Mm -hmm. because it could be a multitude of reasons why they don't, but one of them could be just a lack of compassion in the first place. Exactly. I guess my question is this then, like, under her view, I, I don't think she would require that you get the shot. Right. Well, I, so, I wasn't so I saying guess... require. I, I wanted to take actions out of it. I don't even know how she could, because we were talking about like the core values of it. On her view, how do you even get that value off the ground? Can you, I'm sorry. Can you clarify that? How, so how do you get the value that it's objectively better for people to take the shot, right? The people who are low on, on compassion without then bringing back in that paternalism. I don't know that she would actually... I, I I don't know that you would actually say that it's necessary for egalitarianism to address the shot question. I can I think it might be helpful here to read like her definition in her. Um, hey, can we do this? Poem. Can we take a, a short break? I need to, to to pee and I want to get like some more tea and then let's actually just talk about her view. Yeah. Does that sound okay? Yeah. That's fine. Okay. Okay. All right. I'll be right back. Given you agree though that, that that does seem like outside the uh, like the confines of this discussion, right? Does it not? Like um, like his example there because it the, seems the, like so the question is like there is a spectrum of compassion. I was actually just about to read. I think this will actually help if you want to go to page three thirteen. This is where she actually contrasts the main points of democratic equality versus luck egalitarianism, and she says. Equality of fortune is a distributive theory. It conceives of equality as a pattern of distribution. This would obviously be the pattern of compassion. That would be the distribution of compassion in this case. And then she says, um, you know, you're equal as long as you have equal amounts of some distributable good in the view of luck luck egalitarians. And then she said, by contrast, democratic, democratic equality regards two people as equal when each accepts the obligation to justify their actions by principles acceptable to the other and in which they take mutual consultation, reciprocation, and recognition for granted. And it's a, that's a very, very long assessment, but she can, that is the contrast with the pattern of distribution. So depending on how like Jordan's compassion fits into that, that part of the democratic equality, it may or may not fit. It may or may not be subject to, you know, her concern. Let me read that line here. What's that? Let me just read that line yeah, again yeah. myself. Page 313. It's, it's, it's a little the bottom. Wordy, is it not? Oh, I, oh, I literally yeah. <laughs> underlined it and I wrote, hmm. Yeah, yeah. Let me, let me read that again myself here. Yeah, because I mean, that's the key to this question here is whether or not it fits into this or any of the other points that she says, like in contrasting them. I guess I just don't understand that line at all. Because I, 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 it's I don't know. Because I, I, you know, I, I don't see how that could actually obtain, right? Because like democratic equality regards two people as equal, okay? Yes. When each accepts the obligation to justify. So they've got, a, they're obliged to justify their actions by principles acceptable to the other. Well, I don't see how that's going to work. Because I, you know, what is that? People who have explained their actions to me and I do not find their principles acceptable. I'm reading it further on onto the next page to see if she says it a little easier. Hmm. 
So, so on the beginning of 314, she does say this implies third that democratic equality is sensitive to the need to in, uh, integrate the demands of equal recognition with those of equal distribution. Um, so it, would, it seems like there's the question of whether such a person would be, you know, the circumstances are one that makes to like a relationship unequal. And then second of all is whether or how to remedy that. That's the beginning of 314 is like um, the goods must be distributed according to principles and processes that express respect for all. So it's kind of a two, two aspects here, it seems. What, what were you guys talking about? We were kind of just um, prepping for when you return about your concern and the question and trying to fit it into Anderson's model. We're at page 313 and 314. Why don't you why don't you go ahead and just tell me like Giffen, how do you view what her positive proposal is? Because like I think that that's just a good like for me especially, but also I mean for the episode. You know like, what I mean? With like, respect, what, just the whole thing, not with respect to your question? Yeah, just just in general terms. Cause I like we've beat around the bush with that for too long. Like I may even edit this and put it closer to the episode just because like we should have, you know what I mean? So like what like explain to me, because I think you're obviously the best reader of this paper at this you know so far so like what mm -hmm. well, you're yeah, better um, well, you're better than old fog brains over here. <laughs> fog one and fog two <laughs> um <laughs> i'm trying to find like a good a specific quote or even just in your own words like how you know i mean we oh can... oh yeah so basically what i she is just wants to reframe the entire debate about egalitarianism to address what the point was originally slash should be now yeah and that is to say it doesn't the the point of egalitarianism isn't specifically to address like you know brute luck um it is actually to make a community of equals like a slash end oppression whatever conception mm -hmm. you know is preferred in this case um there are some specific details that she lays out that make it a little bit difficult and that only really appear in her section the second part of the paper um like what is democratic equality uh but broadly i kind of agree with like the the framing i don't know that i don't think she would say that like this should be the the only thing we should consider like egalitarianism mm -hmm. in society's construction but it is the main like it is a central pillar um of like the discussion i i yeah. kind of do agree like um it seems to have a lot of desirable features um it doesn't seem to like well, I mean, the, all the criticisms of lucky egalitarianism that I thought were pretty valid. Um, mm -hmm. So she seems to address most of those here. Um, but again, uh, I, how should I say this? I, I, I do think it is a worthwhile goal to reframe the discussion about egalitarianism to focus on oppression. Yeah, That makes sense to me. Um, and it is able to disregard some of the odd conversation that we read in lucky egalitarianism. Um, she wait, calls um, wait hold on i'm sorry just a clarifying question yeah. before you continue because this is good it because it seems do, does she say which one does she say is actually her core value the prevention of oppression or creating in a, a community of equals i think oh, the, she the said ladder. there's two the ladder. i okay. think it's two i think she says there is a negative aspect and a positive aspect Yo, oh i remember a quote about that yeah i, I, I don't i think that? it's on one of these pages i just don't see it in front of me immediately because that was another, I don't, I don't mean to like bring up questions already, but I just, I need to understand oh, exactly cool. what she says. Yeah. Um, because I think that one of those entails the negation of the other. Well, I think it's actually on the previous page. Hold on. Oh yeah, Giffen, you're totally right. Yeah. Is this is at the very beginning of part two. What is the point of equality as this section's? Well, what page? You know, what page? Uh, 3, 312. 313, if you want to get exactly what she says here, because first, democratic equality aims to abolish socially created oppression. Oh, equality yeah. so, is, can we keep going there? Uh, I was going to say, that is where she contrasts democratic equality with the equality of fortune, but previously is where she makes the positive and negative aspects clear. Mm. Um, and I, you can read that part, but I do want to read this part first. She says in this is the bottom of 312 egalitarian political movements oppose such hierarchies mm. you know she talked about the previously um dot, dot dot negatively the claim repudiates 
distinctions of moral worth based on birth or social identity, on family membership, inherited social status, race, ethnicity, gender, etc. Um, you know, there's no natural slaves, plebes, mm-hmm. or aristocrats. And then positively, the claim asserts that all competent adults, because that's actually good to know, adults. Mm-hmm. So she actually, this whole conversation about competent adults. So that's yeah, actually good. To know. Yeah. She didn't define any of this, but um, anyways, the claim asserts that all competent, positive, uh, uh, Poly- all, no negative adults no shall negative. have rights. <laughs> no, the natural slave class. Those born without <laughs> compassion do not have rights. <laughs> the claim asserts that all competent adults are equally moral agents. Everyone equally has the power to develop and exercise moral responsibility to cooperate mm. with others according to the principles of justice to shape and fulfill a conception of their good. So that is kind of like the two frameworks. And this, there are, it's not, uh, you know, clearly well defined. Mm-hmm. Um, she t- tables a lot of things like it's framed within the space of competent adults. She doesn't really define it. Yeah. Um, I, I can't imagine how long this paper would be if she had to define all these components. Oh, of course, of course. Um, it would. Uh, she probably ought, maybe she ought to have split this into lucky egalitarian bad, and then second paper, like you know, democratic equality good. But either way, so that's the aspect about like the negative and positive aspects. Um, and then the next the beginning of the next page actually says similarly negatively egalitarian seek to abolish oppression. And then positively egalitarians seek a social order in which persons stand in relations of equality. So those, that's the, the negative and positive aspect. To it. Yeah. And they may conflict, um, Jordan, if, and I imagine that's what you're going to bring up. Yeah. And then after that, she discusses the specific aspects of democratic equality, um, like the goals, mm-hmm. like these are the aims compared to lucky egalitarianism. And Adam, you were starting to read this and you, you can uh, go ahead and read that as, if you'd like. Yeah, Just to read okay. what I think. So first, democratic equality aims to abolish socially created oppression. Mm. Equality of fortune aims to correct what it takes to be injustices created by the natural order. Second, uh, democratic equality is what I shall call a relational theory of equality. In other words, it views equality as a social relationship. Equality of fortune is a distributive theory of equality. It conceives of equality as a pattern of distribution. Mm. So, okay, so that clarifies a bit. It does. So, thus, equality of fortune regards two people as equal so long as they enjoy equal amounts of some distributable good, income, resources, opportunities for welfare, and so forth. Social relationships are largely seen as instrumental to generating such patterns of distribution. By contrast, democratic equality regards two people as equal when each accepts the obligation to justify their actions Hmm. by principles acceptable to the other and in which they take mutual consultation, reciprocation, and recognition for granted. A That's a bulky. That yeah. yeah. So I have okay. Okay. <laughs> Here's is there more that we should talk about in her view before I raise the criticisms? Because I I I don't know. The more we read I I will actually contribute something, I think. Um so um from what I gathered from those those first two points where she contrasts them is that um within the view of luck egalitarianism uh social relationships are an instrument to generate the goal of like the pattern distribution right yeah. whereas she would say this this um patterns of distribution or redistribution generally is instrumental to creating or can be instrumental to creating the proper social relationships which is the goal i think that's kind of the key here so i yeah. i do think she said it's it's not non-distributive but it's not strictly distributive if that makes sense this actually mirrors a lot of the discussion at least the holistic vibes if you will of the previous paper that we were talking about right how like you know retributive justice or like justice as we currently have is very cold and calculating and it removes the individuals in question she's essentially kind of making a very similar point against luck egalitarianism like it's very cold and it's not based it's using people's social status and interactions as a tool to get material equality. And that's bad. Like, I agree with that wholeheartedly. Um, you might sense there's a but coming. 
but I'm sorry, but Giffen, did you, did you, did you have more? No, that was it. I'm waiting for your butt. Okay. Here's what I don't understand about this proposal. It seems like the negative and the positive claims that she has can very obviously come at odds to each other. Right. So she says um, that negatively uh, it, it repudiates uh, distinctions of moral worth based on birth or social identity or on family membership, inherited social status, race, ethnicity, gender, or genes, right? That's the luck part kind of cashed out in her own terms. Um, but then positively, the claim asserts that all competent adults are equally moral agents. Everyone equally has the power to develop and exercise moral responsibility, mm -hmm. to cooperate with others according to principles of justice, and to shape and fulfill a, con a conception of their good. Okay. And she thinks that that more positive move really negates the paternalism of luck egalitarianism, where the paternalism there, I take it, is that, you know, oh, poor you, you know, she, she paints it as like a very pitying picture. I thought yeah. a little bit unfairly, but I've already made that clear. Um, okay, yeah, I thought that as well at first, to be frank. Yeah. Here's my, here's my question, like with her view, though. Take an, take an example of... Um, and she brings up examples that are close to this. We can find them if we want, but like, uh, like a very, just take, just take a, um, just take like a community from like the, the racist South in the 1960s, right? Sure. Um, 1950s, let's make it. So, you know, they're obviously incredibly uh, immoral and, and denigrating, no, sorry, not denigrating, diminishing of people's status, like, you know, the Jim Crow laws, right? Of course. Okay, that those laws are obviously something that um, a luck egalitarian would be against, and she would be against, right? Because on the luck egalitarian view, it's punishing people for arbitrariness, for right? brute luck. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And on her view, people are obviously it's not, not, not even equal. not addressing; it's punishing. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And on her view. I take it that she would respond that, okay, that's not good because it, it doesn't treat people as equal citizens, right? Okay, here's my criticism then. She has to be paternalistic to make that claim. She has to say, and I, I, I'll find more examples of this because I have like notes written down. She has to value negative freedom over positive freedom. She has to value freedom from over freedom to do things, right? So she, she has to be committed to like the paternalistic value of saying, okay, no, your racism, like your uh, obsession with oppressing this group of people based on arbitrary factors is not a valid value in our system uh, because it doesn't allow people to be equals. But the problem is, is that so long as you grant that there will be people who hold stupid views like that, she has to treat them as kind of unequal. But it's because of the, like the brute fact that, you know, they were born in, in fucked up societies themselves, right? So, okay, I know I'm, I made that in like a really circuitous way, but what do you guys think of that point that she has to, she has to be paternalistic in exactly the same ways she criticized luck egalitarians as being paternalistic in? That's a very good point. Can she define, I mean, I don't know if she successfully defines paternalism well enough in order yeah, to even, I don't think she even for her own like good. Yeah. Um, and that, that would be a pretty key criticism. Well, is, can I, can I give a, I thought a working definition of paternalism when she defined it was yeah. making an objective claim that some people's values are better than others. Right. Or that some values, you don't have enough to say people's values. Some values are better than others because she made that point. Like, well, it's kind of, it's wrong to like pity someone for being deaf, right? Like she, she painted that as like being the very pitying view, right? But I thought mm -hmm. that she stacked the examples really well. You, you know what might be um, enlightening here? Do you remember the example that she gave? Um, maybe we talked about this already, about the person who might value um, above their own, like mm. uh, like the, 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 the religious organ donations oh, or oh. whatever it was. Organ selling might be another good example. I thought the, yeah, because like it, 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 your question hinges on like about the paternalism hinges on how she explains those cases, and I don't remember fully. 
Um, because clearly, let's, like, let's find one of those cases. I think then. she basically would broadly say, like, it's not that we're choosing a value; it's that it's irrelevant because of this other thing that is invoked first. Yeah. But I, again, but it, it very, very. Um, close reading will determine whether that's actually paternalistic or not. Okay, I I, I'm, I don't remember what this is. I we're, should have marked like where different things came up. I mean, I tr- there's I, there's so many things to mark though. It's such a th- that's the that was the problem. I, you know, in hindsight, to be honest, I should have had different problems like in a word document and then quotes addressing those problems. But like, oh oh, okay, I, I found it. I hundred okay. percent found it. Three nineteen. Three nineteen. Thank you. Because she's actually she posits herself. Um, isn't it paternalistic to de- excuse me? Isn't it paternalistic to deny her the freedom to trade, um, in it and inalienable rights? So this is like second paragraph. Which, which specific example was this? It was uh, three nineteen second paragraph, and then this is um, she's broadly talking uh, about in- okay. inalienable rights. Yeah, um, she doesn't say anything specific, but I think she does later down. Mm-hmm. Um, so again, the question is, why shouldn't she be free to trade some of her egalitarian guaranteed freedoms for other goods that she prefers? Hmm. This is kind of, I think, in the scope of what we were discussing. Yeah. Isn't it paternalistic to deny her the freedom to trade? Right? Hmm. Are we not, like, in the denial, aren't we invoking some sort of value, evaluation of, like, you know, her values? And then the next paragraphs must address that. Or well, at least I have I it. Do. Yeah, I actually, oh, yeah. I have the quotes. She, she says Kant would put it in the following terms. Each, every individual has a worth or dignity that is not conditional upon anyone's desires or preferences, not even the individual's own desires. So she's saying in non-Kantian locution that basically you don't get to void your status as an intrinsic good. Like you don't get to, so like under her view, each individual has inalienable rights and you don't get to um, like void those rights of anyone and anyone includes yourself. I think that that's totally fucking reasonable, but I think that that's really paternalistic. Like I, I just, I think that she, she highlighted the dangers of paternalism with like egalitarianism fairly well. Yeah. Like, but, but I also think that she did a lot of spinning Right, she spun it as like contemptuously pitying people, which like, you know, Rakowski might or well, Rakowski she pitied no one as we saw, but <laughs> but right, like okay, so so her concern is completely valid. We don't want to pity people, um, and like that gets cashed out in you know like a lot of ableist ways, right? We don't want to pity people who have certain disabilities or handicaps, um, but I think that paternalism absolutely has to play a role if you're going to make if you're going to have some sort of a hierarchy of values which she obviously does you have to be able to like say no you're actually wrong like to want to express this value and she does it here like she's actually saying okay the value of preserving the dignity or or intrinsic worth of the individual trumps even that individual's desires i'm sorry but how is that not paternalistic yeah, I think that would be a great question. I would be very curious to see how she answers that. I just thought like paternalism reemerged in all of the ways she criticized luck egalitarianism for having it. So like, so, so go back to my example, right? Like, so she, she criticized, um, she criticized luck egalitarians for pitying people who were deaf or who weren't as smart, you know, like, oh, you know, poor, poor idiots, right? And she, she kind of painted that as like a really sneering thing to do, right? But so there she's, crit- so if you look at what's underneath that, underneath that is the value of it's better to be more competent than less, essentially, right? And she was saying that it's paternalistic to kind of have that hierarchy of values. But if she has the goal of eliminating oppression, and thus having pe- you know, people have equal status, you have to be paternalistic in precisely that same way because people aren't going to just agree. Like in a, you know, like a kumbaya world, like we all are equal and everyone thinks everyone else is equal. Yeah, that, but okay. But like, we don't really have to worry about like egalitarianism at that point. She, she isn't, she puts herself or just like reality puts her in the position of saying, no, like your, your racist attitudes towards you don't want to have to serve black people or something like that. That's not a legitimate value in our society. 
so yeah, it seems like there may be one deep kernel of paternalism. Um, so I'm reading here, this is still on 319. Okay. Um, basically, okay, uh, let me let me get what paragraph? Uh, I think it's the same one where she discusses Kant, but at the bottom. Mm-hmm. In basing inalienable rights on what others are obligated to do, mm-hmm. rather than on the right bearer's own subjective interests, democratic equality satisfies the second desideratum of egalitarian theory to justify lifetime guarantees without resorting to paternalism. So basically, it kind of is already built in the idea that the obligations are present. Mm-hmm. Um, if you kind of already agree that the obligations are there, then all other aspects of paternalism can go away, but that in and of itself may be paternalistic. Yeah. Okay. That, so I think that kind of captures the concern. But I think that that would be gravely misrepresenting the argument to say that, oh, our system doesn't have the issues of paternalism, where it's like, well, you know, no, after the most paternalistic assumption ever. You know what I mean? After the grand paternalism, you don't need any further paternalism. It's basically what she's claiming i guess i even disagree with like but i think that that does get cashed out in like extremely paternalistic details so like let's smear this again in basing inalienable rights on what others are obligated to do rather than on the rights bearer's own subjective interest democratic equality satisfies the second desideratum of egalitarian theory to justify lifetime guarantees without resorting to paternalism. But okay. Yeah. That, that's what I, I think that to justify lifetime guarantees is extremely paternalistic, but in a good way, like I, like I'm, I, I guess have like slightly more, I'm like slightly more okay with like authoritarian aspects of paternalism in the sense that like we just do have to make those values like we do have to make those value claims it's yeah. like no you actually all, don't get to do certain things of all the things she criticized i think the paternalism one was one where i kind of had like the most uncertainty for sure yeah um and i i would really like to see her respond to like hey you have you've buried the paternalism in already to the model and therefore all further ones like may not be needed but you have the one to begin with that's a very you, interesting. You know, the, the gays and lesbian point that she made, um, it's in the next paragraph, I thought really um, exemplified this point too. Because, right, so, so she says on top of 320, gays and lesbians seek the ability to publicly reveal their identities without shame or fear, which requires significant changes in social relations of contempt and hostility and changes in some norms of gender and sexuality. Bingo, I completely agree. However, that entails paternalism. That entails saying the value of being a homophobe is trumped by the value of expressing who you are, your sexual identity. And I think that that is a legitimate case of paternalism. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I think, actually, I don't think you need to invoke either of their I, like values in order to make that. It's, if you accept the obligations that are there, you mm-hmm. can simply say you betrayed your obligation and nothing further. See, but, but I don't think, but you've, but you've, uh, but there's still the paternalism, the original paternalism of that framework, perhaps. Okay. But that, but that almost relies on like this idealized image of what a person should be. Right. So it's like, uh, okay. So just, if you take it on board, like, okay, the homophobic person, like at their core is a homophobic person, right? Like, it's just like part of their identity, like, like deeply just think back, you know, like, people of like our grandfather's generation when they were growing up right like or or you know even just further back or you know whatever right um mm-hmm. that that is like who they are at their core and so she either i think like her position either collapses into one of two things that she chastises luck egalitarianism for it either collapses into this assumption about what the rational kind of third party or like that person's best self, ideally rational self would think or do, or or it's just paternalistic, right? Cause she's, cause like, it's not, it's not equal to be like, because it's not, I don't know. I I don't think it makes sense. I think you have to really kind of um, twist your wording to paint valuing certain things always in terms of, of making people equal right like because you're you're 
okay, I, I'm really butchering my wording here. Um, I don't know. Do you, do you kind of get what I'm saying? I'll try to make it again. I'll try to make it really succinctly. Yeah. You, ha- you have to say to the people who want to discriminate based on race, and there's whole communities based around that from like the, the 50s in the South, right? Of course. You have to say, no, you don't get to do that in our society because we value other things over that. That's denying certain, you, you can't say then that everyone gets to equally express themselves or their values or whatever. But, 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 but what I actually find to say that, like, I don't know, that, that's kind of what I'm trying to get at. Like she, she hinges it on like treating everyone as an end in and of themselves. Okay, but what if they, that person as an end wants to do something that is incompatible with someone else being treated as an end in, in and of themselves? Then you have to make a hierarchy of values choice. And that seems really paternalistic. I'm sure I could make the point like way better if I was actually of sound mind. <laughs> but, I, I, but... I think I understand your point. Um, I hope, hopefully I'm at least making good points in a very poor way. <laughs> no, I, 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 no I, you make sense. Yeah. Um, again, it seems to come down. She really needs to explain her objections with paternalism. If it's not the paternalism itself, it's what aspect of the paternalism that she disagrees with Yeah, and how they like you know would be resolving in the issues we've discussed um because like you you said like the the val there's the values seem to have to come into play in the acceptance of the system of democratic Mm -hmm. equality after that i think you can resolve all the issues without specifically invoking a paternalism of the situation but the paternalism has has simply been absorbed into the system and thus the you can't say there's no paternalism that comes and down. I don't. To, oh, yeah. I don't know. Again, this may simply hinge on her conception of paternalism being slightly different. I don't know if that's actually something broadly informed <laughs> by like lucky egalitarianism literature. Yeah. Or if that's just like you know, um, something that she just simply failed to explain enough, which is that, probably that actually that. that actually perfectly brings me to my next criticism, which was. She she explicitly says actually in the in the in the one that I said um, a lot of her values of of treating people equally requires changes in norms of gender or sexuality or changes in social relations of contempt and hostility right Mm -hmm. okay here's here this was my other potential critique of this in order to do that um (laughs) how exactly does that get cashed out in actionable terms right so like you know this this comes back to my opening remarks essentially of like these things have to get done in some sense, right? Because she's either making this claim about this ideal world in which everyone does have the right changes in social relations and, and norms, but then we don't really have to worry about these concerns. But the luck egalitarian on their side says, wow, we can't legislate things like changes in, in norms of gender or sexuality, changes in norms or cultural practices, right? This, was, this is actually the very point that a lot of people today make with, with um, uh, calling for like affirmative action or some, you know, something like that. We've, we've legislated racial inequality out of, out of the legal code, but we haven't actually changed the social practices of it, right? So the luck egalitarian on their side says, wow, the things that we want to change are actually possible to change because it does, she criticizes it as being cashed out in cold kind of monetary or property terms. But how do you legislate for the changes that she needs in order for her system to get off the ground? On the luck egalitarian side, they can say, well, at least it's possible to do ours, but... but, well, but. I don't know that that's necessarily true of luck egalitarianism. I don't know if it's actually true to legislate theirs you know if we're talking about like true practice well um, it's much to a to a much higher degree than is possible that seems fair um i don't know for sure um but what i will say is if if you look at the she doesn't explain how to get any of these at all she makes she contributes like no but i'm but but i'm not i'm i'm saying it's impossible to like yeah but 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 that i would disagree with well no but if you actually could 
it would be paternalism like dialed to 11 because it would be like we need to actually orchestrate we need to overcome what who people are essentially in order to get the norms and practices to the point where everyone can be equally respected in society so specifically through the lens of paternalism I, let me rephrase this it's because there is an example we can look at yeah is it paternalistic for society to legislate there must be ramps accessible to courtrooms yes but i think in a good way like you, you think it is paternalistic and therefore like anderson can't yes, address yeah. or well, it, it, well it, no it's, but it's, it's inconsistent yeah yeah because it's saying okay because it's saying look for the people for whom this would cost a ton of money think of everyone who owns property like public property you have to pay to put like accessibility ramps in accessibility elevators accessibility bathrooms well, a ton of money she's sure? saying okay a lot of people will value keeping their money and not catering to the small percentage of the population who needs those right yeah. she's saying we don't respect that value we actually respect the value of everyone being able to operate or or function or express their capabilities in an equal way so yeah that's extremely paternalistic i think she's saying no you're actually wrong to hold this value and what's more we're going to legislate that you have to well you can't legislate that you have to hold this value this gets to my other criticism we, we're going to legislate that you have to spend the monetary funds to make it possible for that value but like what, what does it mean to actually like you can't legislate out a norm or a, a social practice. So like, I, I think, I think her, all of her proposals are parasitic on paternalism, but put in practice, they like go way overboard for paternalism. Cause the luck egalitarian can say, yeah, all of that really, really sucks. But at least well, let's, like, let's use something concrete here. So in the case of like someone who, you know, doesn't have access to like the capacity to walk. Right. Yeah, let's go in both instances. So mm -hmm. clear, clearly, um, in Anderson's case, you would say something like, you know, recurrently our society does not grant you access, you know, to those necessary, um, you know, capacity to engage in, yeah. you know, whatever public life, whatever, yada, yada. Sure, sure, sure. And so there must be ramps and then that will allow them to access that and then to express good. themselves fully. Yeah. 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 Whatever, whatever the individual aspects are. Yes. And then how does luck egalitarianism address this? Luck again. Well, I don't know how, but on the basis of it, they would say this is an instance of brute luck where some people don't uh, either don't benefit or suffer like what valence you want to put it right. Mm -hmm. um, based on, on brute luck factors, right? And so to solve this, we can, uh, so, so the, they might say we can either compensate them or they might say, you know, we can just like create a new tax, right? And then, and then pay to like do all of this stuff with that or, or you know, whatever. I, so, well, but, but don't, but don't, but don't hinge it on how it gets laid out. Cause I think how it gets enacted is, is open to either um, view. But it's like, but what I'm, but like the values are, are different. And I think her values are self-contradictory. With respect to paternalism, it may be. But in this case that we're talking about, mm -hmm. if you're using the brute luck distinction, this actually excludes people who made that U-turn. Where's, where's the, where's the paternalism defined again? <laughs> like, I don't know that it fully is. Yeah, can, we, can we go back yeah. to that? Because I, I, I guess I'm, I'm just kind of lost here at this point because for me, this is not at all how I interpreted what she was talking about. Like, because I, I, I always, like, I, the way I read this was it was paternalism with respect to hmm. seeming. I have it. Well, let me, let me finish sure. this thought though. But, but seeming the differences in people like whether they be like immutable qualities or just attributes of people in that it's not up for the, the you know, the, like the state to decide, you know, what is, you know, a congenital um, kind of burden 
mm-hmm. or what is a boon you know what i mean like yeah but it, it seems like but you're kind of almost like taking it further and saying okay well it's not up for the, like, the state to decide which values we value and it's like i just i don't see why we can't distinguish between values but in under yeah. this model the state doesn't distinguish and say okay these are these in fact are good traits you are lucky mm-hmm. these in fact are bad traits you are unlucky and here is money to make up for that but i don't i don't see why that doesn't like i don't see how this precludes like distinguishing between good and bad values though so uh, what I was saying is that I thought the very ways that she said luck egalitarianism was badly paternalistic, I thought that she did those same things or they were could like you, entailed. Could you, could you bring up the part where she yeah. critiques? Okay. I just, I just want to get a better understanding. N- no, it's a, it's a good point. Um, okay. So uh, The other luck egalitarians agree that pure equality of fortune might have to be modified by a significant dose of paternalistic intervention to save the imprudent from the worst consequences of their choices. However, in their view, only paternalistic reasons can justify making mandatory the various universal social insurance program characteristic of modern welfare states, social security, health and disability insurance, disaster relief, and so forth. Only paternalistic reasons justify meeting out individuals' basic income grants on a monthly basis rather than a lump sum upon the coming of age. Call this the problem of paternalism. I summarized that as, quote, overprotection and regulation for people's best, best interests, essentially saying, you don't know what's good for you. We are going to legislate otherwise. Or, or even more broadly, not just that you don't know what's good for you, because there was also like, you know... I think it's more along the ideas of like the state will take care of you. Yeah. Like, like regardless of whether it was brute luck um, Mm -hmm. or even like, if you were to open it up to option luck, you know what I mean? It's like, if you are like, because like she brings up the problem of like, you know, the prudent. And that was in the option luck. Yeah. Section. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's like, okay. a, A paternalistic, the paternalistic hand of the state is the state will take care of you. Um, and that's the justification. And that exact sense of we will take care of you seems to reemerge in her. We need to make sure that the social norms go back to the gays and lesbians example of hers. Right. You know, that is her saying. But but all all I'm saying but she, is that but she does bring up the fact that some of these things need to be kind of grassroots, you know, organization need to kind of foster some of the, you know, um, equality among peoples and attitudes because you're talking about an attitudinal change here and she's saying well Mm -hmm. you really can't legislate and it's not up to the state to you know uh kind of coerce some attitudinal change that that is up to people ultimately Mm -hmm. for that to occur yeah um so i I don't think laws that but laws that prevent oppression, for instance, would be something that so, so like, you know, the, the abolition of Jim Crow laws or equal, you know, e- equal rights legislation, you know, like the whatever like that case from 2015, like, you know, the the cake baker. Remember? Sure. Um, I, I'm just saying that 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 seems paternalistic in the exact same ways. But all I'm saying is that's not wrong. Like like to be paternalistic in certain ways isn't wrong. I know she does comment on the role a democratic institution plays where, you know, you have an elected body Mm. that was elected by a majority of the people that then go on to enact the legislation. So is that, is that paternalistic whenever you've got a body of, of of elected individuals, you know what I mean? Kind of representing the people at large. It's because it's, more of a ground up sort of yeah that, I, I mean then it seems one. like but but doesn't it then seem like you can't end oppression and treat people as equals then because what if you just what if we just stipulate that you don't have to stipulate it just rewind the clock right like what if the majority of the citizens of the country had uh were in favor of segregation like unequal segregation 
Th what, then do you, it's, what, what, do you, what do you think that would indicate? Well, I think that then she would be faced with, okay, this party wants to govern itself, right? So that's sort of like the respect, that was how she avoided the paternalism because it's not like some external entity, like, you know, oh, we'll take care of you. But, but then that, like we have seen in the history of the US is just going to be like this starkly inegalitarian outcome. Yeah, and so she would say that's, you know, you know, there's you haven't achieved equality there. Yeah. So uh, then, so, grounding. so then I would respond. Okay, so your system only works. So then she's relying on this thing that she again criticized like egalitarian for, like egalitarianism for, which is like it relies on people's like abstract, rational best selves. Doesn't hers do the same thing then? Well. I mean, it just kind of depends. Like it's in one sense, it's like, okay, how does it get carried out versus like, what's mm -hmm. the grounding for this? So like the, the grounding for it is for achieving equality is we want to eliminate oppression. Mm -hmm. I think that needs to be, that concept needs to be divorced from how that actually happens. Right. So it's like, okay. yeah, all I was saying is that that value ending oppression can be directly in conflict with her other value of treating people as equal like tr i take it that treating people as equal means that they get to you know live out their desires and capabilities or whatever right well i think uh, I she don't... defines it like okay well let's, let's how, how is let's that go yeah. exactly how she defines it. yeah yeah please 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 it was the really wordy uh it was the where she mentioned kant right underneath it this would be uh Page 313, I believe. Okay. So, second, democratic equality is what I shall call a relational theory of equality. If you use equality as a social relationship, equality of fortune is a distributive theory of equality. It conceives of equality as a pattern of distribution. Okay. Thus, equality of fortune, let's skip that here. Um, Okay, here's by the contrast. Yeah. yeah, by contrast, okay. exactly. By contrast, democratic equality regards two people as equal when each when each accepts the obligation mm -hmm. to justify their actions. By principles acceptable to the other. And that is where, okay, by principles acceptable to the other. This is where she's either relying on this like really abstract version of like people's best rational selves. Or it's entirely self-contradictory because all you have to do is grant the possibility that the majority of the country or the nation or the, the state that she's describing doesn't hold egalitarian values. Then what? Like, she, if what she's saying is, if everyone has the right values, then this is how it should play out, then yeah, sure. But like, do, do, you, get, do you get like my criticism there? Because she says, okay. By contrast, democratic equality regards two people as equal when each accepts the obligation to justify their actions by principles acceptable to the other. Two thumbs up when we're lucky enough that that happens, right? So that's so I take it that an instance of that would be me saying, I'm not particularly attracted to men, but it would, but I do not want to restrict the freedom of men who are attracted to other men to engage in any, any relation, social context in which someone's relationship would be relevant, marriage, um, adoption, right? Like those things. Yeah. Okay. Boom. That's a pr all works out. Accepted by the other. But what if I'm a homophobe and, and the majority of the country is right. Then you're put in a position where, the after the when in that sentence uh, isn't fulfilled. Okay, so then what? So then I'm saying the, the, the rational thing to do there would be paternalistic, saying we don't respect, you know, we're not actually going to allow you to um, express your values or what you want to see happen in that way because it's unjust. I, I just, well, I just don't me, see, because I, I think they're, no. the goal is to like move toward that. I mean, 
think about like the, like the okay. majority of people like you interact with in your own life, right? Mm-hmm. Where obviously it's a select few, right? But sure. the way you view others and the way they view you is like, you know, they, they, they respect the justifications that you give for your own life mm-hmm. and your friends, you know, don't view you as unequal. So you might say, okay, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Well, that, that relationship doesn't occur between everybody. No, of course not. But certainly the country is moving in that direction where lots of people in this country at this point yeah. can recognize differences and different justifications, but can respect and understand different justifications. So it's like, is it for the state to mandate that everybody respect each other and, you know, and understand yeah, of course each so. other? Yeah. But no, yeah. but I think that's certainly a, 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 an honorable goal for equality where it's like, we're kind of, of moving course. that direction. So. Uh, yeah. But and, what I'm saying is I don't understand how her view, I totally, the weird thing is, is like, I totally agree with how this gets expressed, but I don't know how she's grounding that. Because like, like essentially when I, so the example you just gave, like, you know, our country, the U.S. is moving in that direction. Yeah. Right. But, but it seems to me that that is expressing at least a comfortableness, a, like a very, a very comfortable nature of being paternalistic towards the Mm. minority in that, in those situations. Can I maybe offer a comparison that might be useful? Yeah. Okay, so I think democratic equality is the goal, and the goal in itself does not involve paternalism. She does not actually make any claims about how to get there. That may yeah. involve paternalism. It may be inevitably involving paternalism. I think what she's saying is mm-hmm. the the goal of luck egalitarianism has to invoke paternalism, whereas the goal of democratic equality does not, even if getting there would. Does that make sense? When, with like a Galatina, yeah, 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 makes sense. And that requires Wait, what, okay, that makes sense. But yeah. ha, but how does how does luck egalitarianism exert? Uh, uh, how does luck egalitarianism have intrinsic to it paternalism in a way that her view doesn't? Though that's what I'm confused about. Well, the point of the equality of fortune is like the equality of the distribution of goods, and you can't yeah. you cannot possibly distribute the goods um with like well assess and you know redistribute the goods yeah yeah without invoking paternalism because it involves a state i mean it has because to. even okay wait, wait, wait because even in a i take it that what you're saying is even in a even in the situation where everyone does have the right attitudes there's still going to be disparities in luck right and so in that the paternalism comes out in that there has to be like this intrinsic pitying of people who are worse off. Yeah. The only way inherently that luck egalitarianism can, can do the thing that its goal is to do has to involve paternalism. Now, in terms of like getting there, I think that's mm-hmm. actually, you, you've made it clear that I don't think you can not invoke paternalism when you're saying like trying to get you right. When you're trying to get to democratic equality. Yeah. You kind of have to. And like, I think all she is saying in this paper is this is the goal. Mm. And the goal itself doesn't involve paternalism. And then if you would maybe ask her like, okay, but if we want to get there as a society, like, you know, in the conceivable future, will it involve paternalism on the part of like any entity? And she'll probably say, yeah. I mean, I I don't know what you would say. She might reframe it. But I mean, it, it seems inconceivable to me that you could actually say no to that. Yeah. Otherwise, you're just waiting, I, I, you're just waiting yeah. for things to align. Given, I think you and I are on the same page. I definitely agree with that perspective at this point. No, Jordan, so, I'm really glad you brought that up because I actually did, it wasn't clear to me until we really hashed that out. And it unfortunately it does kind of hinge on that I, long sentence on 313. Yeah. I just worry that she's almost making a very circular claim. I just worry that she's making the claim that when people have the right attitudes, this is the system that we get to live in. And she's right about that claim. I just don't think that that claim says a lot. I mean, it doesn't really, she doesn't address a lot of things. Like she could definitely have written like another 50 pages on like what to do when we don't have democratic equality. Yeah. And that could involve paternalism to the nth degree, like you've described. But this is kind of just saying yeah. this paper is basically 
hey, luck egalitarians, which have dominated the literature, your goal is not the goal. And one of those reasons that it shouldn't mm-hmm. be the goal is because it has to invoke paternalism because yeah. the goal itself involves like state real allocation of goods. Does that make sense? I, I, I feel like that's yeah. a pretty acceptable definition. Yeah, I, I guess maybe where I'm kind of landing is that I guess I just view... I guess I'm in a weird position because I view, I guess I'm kind of viewing like luck egalitarianism and her democratic egalitarianism. Like neither of those are the base value for me. It's like, it's like well being and suffering is the base value. So then, like, what practical system best um, results but, 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 in but, that? But, but hang on, I, I got to make this point though. But, that, but that's why it's in, like, she incorporates like the role of the government here where it's like, mm-hmm. okay, under your system, or I guess I'll, I'll be in with her system under her system. Mm-hmm. When someone born with a club foot is, you know, is treated well and respected by everyone in society. And the government provides a few key resources that ensure that everyone in society is an equal citizen. Mm-hmm. What role does the government have then to compensate that person born with the club foot under your system or under lucky gals? Well, they already have compensated them, right? But just like not, they haven't cut them a check, but they've, they've compensated them in that they've legislated and built a society such that that person can be an equal member, right? Well, I mean, sort of in the sense that like, yeah, I mean, you can still, you can build things like, you know, ramps yeah. and allow a person to function, you know, within society fairly All, well. Mm-hmm. But but there is still like some deeply unequal thing about being born with a club. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So it's like, okay, under um, luck egalitarianism, mm-hmm. would you be compensated for that brute luck there, regardless of how well society at large sort of accommodates your issue. Yeah. yeah, I think that that would be paternalistic in a bad sense to do that. But I think that that's kind of, uh, but isn't that just like the really just worst version of luck egalitarianism? Like my question is, I guess, I guess my question is like, she had, she didn't make it clear in the paper to me why everything that she proposes can't be done congruently by the luck egalitarian like like she gave really good examples of bad luck egalitarians do you know what i mean but like why if you broaden the conception of luck like the tiniest bit and i don't think in like a disingenuous way you it seems like you get everything that she wants right like because all you have to grant is that you know someone with a clubbed foot like, which is better to be born in a clubbed foot, <laughs> to be born in a clubbed foot? <laughs> what a horrible existence. I'm sorry. What would she have to say about that? I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, can, you her would be you, can her of you handle that counter objection? <laughs> <laughs> the case of the born in club foot. <laughs> <laughs> he lives and dies within the clubbed foot. Don't you understand? Where is democratic equality now? He should, he should be compensated. Wait, wait, before I lose this point, before I lose this point. Um, You're the dollar. Wait, before I lose this point, please. Uh, okay, is it is it better to be born with a clubbed foot in a world that doesn't allow you to really kind of be a full person? There's no accessibility ramps, yada, yada, right? Um, but you're compensated monetarily for your losses. Or is it, and I think the answer is obvious, is it better to be born with a clubbed foot in a world where you don't get monetary benefits, but uh, through the use of monetary benefits, monetary resources, the world has been shaped such that you can live at the same kind of functional level as everyone else, even though you're still born out of that, right? I, I just don't understand. Wait, okay. It's obviously better for the second world, right? Mm-hmm. And I understand how I, the... I, I disagree with the setup, you know. Well, do you know where it's going? Well, I, 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 I already rejected at this point because both worlds, they have 
the ramps and everything in place, right? No, like, no, I wasn't saying that. I, no, I mean, I'm, I'm oh. saying it has to be that way because I, I, I'm not, I'm not going to like concede that distinction there. I'm going to say that like, let's take out that variable entirely. Both worlds. Okay, both worlds they, have they, the they, ramps. They yeah. can function equally. Okay, okay. Like the both, both, both in, in both worlds. And in one, and in world B, you're compensated for your bad luck monetarily. In world A, you're not. In world A, you're not. But in world A, everybody, you know views you as an equal mm-hmm. in, in all in all respects but in world but in the first world where you're monetarily compensated they don't because Isn't that you're, no- you're, you're actually you're actually kind of a pitied person in fact you're like you're someone that the state needs to take care of needs to compensate for being born you know with this congenital you know abnormality even if you it, it, it's, it's a perspective difference you mm-hmm. It's a perspective difference. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. so you're making the claim that by giving them money, it just is a fact that if we know, if we live in a world in which accessibility is not a, a, not a problem, yeah, it's just a fact of our psychology that we will pity people who receive additional aid on top of that. Yeah. They'll pity themselves. Yeah. I think, it's well, I think it's more of like the state is envy. invoking pity. We're in its redistribution, invoking pity in its redistribution, um, right? Like in, in, in that, the, imagine that they both have. Like wait, actually, point. let me just concede that point. Cool. Yeah, I think that that's exactly right. In that extremely idealized world, um, I just don't understand. Okay, so if that's all she's saying, I agree with it. But I thought she was saying more than that. Like, I, I think she's saying that explains well with the paternalism point. It's like you know, that's not there in this case, because the state never had to come in and say, well, this is a, you know, this is bad luck for you. Wait, and hold on, hold on. Adam, Adam, Adam is point is precisely right. And she should not bring in cultural, anything cultural about that then. Yeah, I, I think it's really a perspective difference a perspective yes. change here. But she where... didn't make, but to be honest, I think she didn't make the point in the way that you just did, where you actually have to lay out that psychological fact. Like you actually, and she doesn't do, I think she makes her case in a really poor way then. Mm. Like, because that, what you just added to her proposal is not present in there. Like you have to, you have to stipulate that the end goal is, you have to you actually have to give that thought experiment essentially like for the point to land i i, I think i think you do um just because it honestly took like two hours of talking about this for everything kind of kind of crystallize <laughs> but it does make sense that she's saying like okay just here are all like the the problems of compensating an individual like this here are the you know the paternalism issue the pity mm. issue and it's like, wouldn't it in fact just be better if there was just a perspective change yeah. in society? And that's what we're aiming for ultimately. But, than- but, but she can't phrase it like that, right? She's got to say, wouldn't it be better because we can't legislate attitudes for us to just change society such that people of all luck outcomes are able to nullify those luck outcomes? Because she, she, it looks like she like disabuses luck. Actually, her proposal is like, poorly absorbing luck but she's right but she's just trying to negate it in a way that actually respects people's autonomy better well the right kinds of luck also she's defining the correct spaces that's relevant yeah but a Whereas, like egalitarian has that open to them too it's like i think she's well okay now, now yeah. i actually understand where i what i think i think she shoots herself in the foot essentially with the way she puts puts the argument together i'm curious how well like our reading of this has been informed by our previous um well two like arcs on morality mm-hmm. and um because i i don't i'm curious if we had read that with read this without those if we would have the same kind of objections um maybe but I, I, I i think i mean it's over 50 pages it's going to be impossible to, to for it to crystallize super easily um, i agree but 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 to be honest like don't you think it would actually be a much more reasonable proposal if she said look you know Luck egalitarians are largely right, but they actually miss something crucial in focusing on um, um, physical or property uh, or monetary ways to absolve differences in luck. But they're distributions actually, of goods. Yeah, thank you. That was yeah, distributions of goods. 
But they're actually quite right that it's abhorrent to us that people can be made to suffer due to bad luck. But here's a better way to actually resolve that in a way that conserves everything that luck egalitarianism rightly has to offer. Instead of talking about Rakowski's, like, let them die on the streets, (laughs) right? She should have said that and say, look, in, in a world in which someone who is born with a clubbed foot is able to live as an equal, they shouldn't get Uh, a monetary compensation, not because they don't deserve it, because they still might might actually, but it would actually be worse for them because of the way it would affect their social interactions, which on an Aristotelian kind of like function as a person view is actually more at the core of what it means to live as as a human being. Thus, she's almost like a strand of luck egalitarianism, but in like a more holistic way. She's like a holistic luck egalitarianism, which if that's her view, Sign me up on the dotted line at this point. I think she shoots herself in the foot of how she argues for it. I don't know that she would con- she would be a strand of luck egalitarianism. Well, I-, I think theoretically her view is actually, but based on what I just said. Well, I, I thought I understood everything you were saying until you made that claim, and I well, didn't see how that followed. I think it's a strand of luck egalitarianism in that it res- it it its motivation is based on uh, sh- she's a strand of brute luck. Uh, uh, egalitarianism because her her whole thing is like um look you know she focuses on very brute luck issues right she focuses on deafness she focuses on sexual orientation she focuses on disabilities right those are extremely brute luck things um because you don't choose any of those presumably but uh she all, all she does, and I actually, now, I wish you would have, if this is what she means, it's, it's, it's actually really, really good. All she's doing is saying, look, this narrow way of compensating people with distributions of goods is so callously narrow that it doesn't actually allow people to flourish as human beings with all the functions that they have. Exactly. But, it's, it's, yeah. more about, it's more about society's perspective about you know, different peoples but here yeah, is, but is, is what we're actually like aiming to achieve rather than some just some monetary compensation for what we deem to be. Unlucky. Yeah. So, and I actually think it's based on the same concerns that luck egalitarians have, but she goes about writing those in a completely different way. I think that's where I would disagree. I don't think it is the same concern because luck egalitarians by definition are concerned with the, the luck and the distribution of goods. Well, no, where she says that that's, don't don't but but the distribution of goods is the way that they solve the problem she wants to solve i think the, i'm no. talking theoretically well she i think theoretically they actually view that as the problem they say there is we I can identify brute and option luck and there is a distribution of goods that is unequal and the goal is to correct that unequal distribution it's and- not logically entailed though like like noticing that there are differences in brute and option luck does not logically entail solving them with a distribution of goods. That is a way to solve that issue. She should frame her alternative as a better way to solve that issue. And entailed in that, in solving the issue of brute luck in that way, uh, that the, the manner in which you solve it is actually what brings on board the respecting people as equals and not oppressing people and preventing oppression. I think I agree more with Giffen though, because no, 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 because Giffen, Giffen's saying this. He's saying like, okay, I don't even. We don't even think that she would view it through that lens though, because you're saying I, I think you're still caught up in saying like, okay, if someone's born with the club foot, mm-hmm. it's kind of unfortunate they're born. <laughs> pretty with unlucky, the club foot. yeah. <laughs> but but she's not even looking at it there through that perspective. She's saying, mm-hmm. in fact. The issue those people face, yeah, is, is not the with the club's foot. You know, it's it's the oppression and the the fact that others don't view them as equal. It, mm-hmm. That that is the issue when they encounter well, other people in it, society. They don't, in fact, like you know, view that person as an equal citizen. But but, lar- but, but I'm sorry, because uh, because I think what she was saying is like more concretely, it's that society is not set up in a way that they can act as equals, right? In some areas, because like it, it's, it depends it's social, because it, exactly, it's which social. involves the institutions, of course, but not is not just the institutions. But what exactly. I'm saying like is, a perspective, the viewpoint, the, it, yeah, it and then been. there's also like the government institutions and what they need to do to ensure that all citizens 
are I you know really, equal standing. Yeah. I really think she sets it up in the wrong way. Then, I think she should set it up as. Oh, I just I guess I hugely disagree with setting it up that way. Then, so well, she. Yeah, but, I think that one of the problems is we're reading this in like you know 2022, where this paper was written in '99, specifically addressing the most popular view at the time. Which I don't think that I mean, entails an issue. the. I, well, I mean, I'm it sure. explains why she is talks so long about luck egalitarianism, and that's the point of contrary. Right. Instead of just stating her positive claim, Giff, we got to remember this is like a work of philosophy, though. So she should be getting at okay, what are like the core motivations, and what do they logically entail? Not how have these been contemporarily like done because that that's more like political theory like what tends to correlate with what like uh what she should say i think this is more theoretically parsimonious she should say look luck egalitarians have identified a problem in brute luck right now let's table option luck for now because that's more complicated yeah um she should say uh, the luck egalitarians have rightly pointed out a massive flaw in our society with brute luck in that if you are born in what we call unlucky ways, you have a worse life. Now, nothing. Now, that's a problem. The way that luck egalitarians have contemporarily gone about solving that is a distribution of goods. I don't think I'm speaking as her that logically follows a, a given solution does not logically follow. Uh, from that that problem. The problem's right. The way that they try to solve it is wrong. I want to propose a new solution to the problem of brute luck as luck egalitarians have, have laid it out. And I want to call that uh, democratic equality, where to truly uh, solve the issues of bad fortune or, or bad luck, right? That entails not being compensated Precisely because you don't actually get to flourish in all of the ways you would if society, because that's the only thing uh, we, we can't legislate people's attitudes. So what can we legislate? We can legislate what the material accessibility of people uh, of, of people born of all you know, types is. Right. So that's the way that is a con that's a concrete way in which we can actually solve these issues. Uh, what am I making any sense or not? What is the smile for? <laughs> no, no, you, you, Adam, you are, but I, I, I still think, I don't know. Given, so, yeah. What, so he, this is what I identified Jordan, whenever you were laying out from mm -hmm. Anderson's perspective, you said like, I agree with the problem, disagree with the way to go about it. Mm -hmm. I think she doesn't disagree. She actually does disagree with the problem. She does not think that the brute luck is the problem. But okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. I understand. Yeah, what you're there you go. Thank you. Not wait, exactly. wait. Exactly. Okay. I think that. Exactly. Wait. No. I think that it's actually deeply entailed in the way she goes about solving it. Okay. Explain, because I we might be here. Okay. The golden land. She's saying that it's actually not. Re repeat your. You you were saying. Repeat what you just said. You, okay. I'll, I'll just repeat the whole thing. You were speaking for Anderson and saying like she should say. Oh, she no no. Skip to the end. It's not actually a problem of luck. Yeah. Okay. The lucky egalitarians identify it as a problem of luck. Anderson does not at all. So the yes. problem is not the same. Okay. I totally disagree. I With think Anderson or our characterization of Anderson. You, well, it, it, neither. I think I'm making a, I'm saying theoretically entailed in trying to solve that. She, she actually is implicitly saying that luck is an issue because she's saying that she might be, actually i think she is saying luck is an issue i don't think she's saying it's the problem yeah, it, yeah okay. I, I i still agree with Giffen. That, 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 that that's exactly the point like, we're brute make. luck i think she would agree that in all the cases relevant brute luck probably plays a role but we should not be targeting brute luck wait 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 here's oh oh okay okay in her i okay in the world in which everyone's accessibility is the same Mm -hmm. Is it still better or worse to be born with a clubbed foot? Well, that's the thing is Anderson's framework, she would probably argue, doesn't need to answer that question because they have the equal things. But lucky egalitarianism by definition. No, no, no. I, I don't care about lucky egalitarianism for a minute. Oh, on well, think, her okay. view. Is it can you once you've established? I think it's equality, preposterous because look, it's not that they it's not that she's saying they are like it's it's not worse. She's saying it's not relevant to equality. Once you have given like it's the, not relevant to political equality, but again, 
Achieve, that's not disavowing. Quality. No, there are going to be differences between people, and yeah. there's, people are going to be born into good and bad luck. So you're still going to have under either system. You're still going to have people that are born into like a billionaire family that's like <laughs> yeah. you know that is like the like the handsomest, smartest <laughs> devil in the world. <laughs> the, the, the Musk like, family, the and, Jordan B. Peters of the world. <laughs> and so you're going to have like obviously. People are going to be born with, like, you know, good and bad luck. Yeah. But the idea is, like, there's no, like, absolute bad luck and no absolute good luck. I disagree like, with that. Uh, are you? Yeah. But, but, but here's the thing. Even in her world. Like, like yeah. but, no, but here's the thing. Like, I, I actually really enjoyed that one thought experiment, which she kind of tore apart, where she talked about, or I, I forget exactly whose view this is. might have been Dworkin's. I don't know. But it was the one where... You compare person A to person B and you compare all their attributes mm -hmm. and um, someone could be almost viewed as like profoundly unlucky if they're just being. Oh, oh yeah. I can promise all three of us right here that there are people in the world who beat us out in almost in every, every single yes. attribute. Yes. Like if, if you go to like, <laughs> Harvard one. Medical School's website right now. Yes. Go through maybe like their graduating class. You'll find just like an. There will be someone idea. who is more athletic, who's smarter, who has better relationships, who's happier. Like everything. Yes. 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 Like all are the you way down. Profoundly unlucky for not being that guy. Yes. I, are you? I mean, you're so much better than a lot of other people. Are you not? Are you profoundly yeah. unlucky for not being that guy? You can separate that claim from the political and societal mechanism by which we, because we can't remedy that deep of luck, right? No, we, well, we, lucky we, no, we, we can't remedy it within their realm. I, I, I couldn't hear. Yes. Either of you. I'm Wait, repeat what? that. Is that <laughs> I, that's what I was going to say? In the case of that, like superhuman, the Oberman, um, the Uber from Harvard Medical, yeah, yeah, from the Harvard Medical School. As long as like the the framework of equality has been reached, Anderson is done with respect to equality. But luck egalitarians would still have to step in and say there is an unequal distribution of goods, and it is within our realm to correct this. Right? No, I think it that would that's still a be concerned man. with the dullards. I think that that is still okay. It's absolutely still a, like a like a concern that they could have. But but it's not like they wouldn't. There's not like a pluralistic sense of a luck egalitarian, right? Where like anything short if she's saying if she's saying like right it's a straw man of luck egalitarianism to say that it has to be like a harrison bergeron world right like do you guys know that short story like no. kurt the kurt vonnegut oh like like a quality of out or, or, or um like um the, the exact equality of outcome is a bad world obviously right where yeah. everyone is equal in exactly the same ways that's like the harrison bergeron story mm -hmm. um but that's a straw. I think that that's like a straw man. Like to say that uh, luck egalitarians, uh, like, is she saying that they like their their worldview kind of degenerates into that, or it's like logically entailed? Because I don't follow. Like, I don't think that that follows. I well, think certainly that guy's view did. Who's uh, uh, whoever whoever put forward that that uh, that model? I don't. I don't know. Should be compensated. Can't, really? Because can't, can't can't you say? Wait, wait. Is it isn't it logically congruent to say? It's true that I'm in a deep sense unlucky not to be better in every way that I am, but it's also true to say that it's not necessarily that we want to enact a political system that negates all of those. Why is that? I think that's so. So, model. so do we do we find the the perfect person in this country, and then anybody who's not them, we're going to compensate to some degree. Uh, depending on how far away they are, it's like okay. That's not what I was when, saying, though. Okay. But, 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 but no, but under this model, you said okay. I the, under that model that was put forward that she critiques, mm -hmm. it's like okay. Uh, someone might say, okay, do you want to be Jordan or that guy? That guy. Okay, <laughs> what if you get a million dollars in your Jordan? Someone's like, okay, I, I might take that. I yeah. think I'd take that. Done. Yeah. And it, but it's like, do you want to be? That guy, the guy with no legs, with like one eye, you know what I mean? Who's like also has like mental deficiencies. It's like, it might take a trillion, you know what I mean? Like it might take yeah. a trillion dollars to like, you know, uh, to live that life. Um, so, and it's the project of luck egalitarianism to make that happen. 
Mm, I don't think that that's logically entailed. I think I just think that she picks the worst luck egalitarians. Like, so in the view of Lucky Gal, her view, of course, is totally reasonable, but that's because she contrasts it to like Radagalski's or Luke. <laughs> Rick, no, she, she Rick does Skolnikov's the like <laughs> Rasputin's <laughs> worldview. Like this is. <laughs> I'm fucking brain dead at this point. I I need to think about this more. But like, I honestly think that her view m- m- makes theoretical. It it makes more. It's more theoretically parsimonious if you actually view it in a completely different way than she does. I, I here's okay. Here's my current position, and I and I'll actually like listen to this when I'm editing this episode because it's going to need a hell of a lot of uh, editing. But I'm curious. Like, here's my current view, and I'm I'll actually update you guys. You know, months from now in the future, or whatever. Whenever I'm like done with all this, um, I think that her conclusion is right in like 95 percent of the ways that she does it, but I think that her argumentation for it is sloppy. And it do- her conclusions don't actually follow because of the way she argues for it. I think that the way I laid it out is more parsimonious. I don't know. That's that's currently where I am. So we don't I- dive back in. You know, it's almost midnight. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But we should make our we should make final our thoughts. final thoughts. That's my final. I was, was going to say that's probably your that's my final thought. thought. And my and again. Thought. Like, I don't know, I don't know this literature, so I'm open to changing my mind about that. Yeah, I think I ultimately agree with her um, in the sense that I don't believe that we should view uh, immutable characteristics in people as either pitiable conditions or, you know, things to be, uh, or reasons to compensate individuals and rather there needs to be or we should aim for a societal perspective shift in which we view others as equals we respect differences and the government plays a role as insofar as to ensure equal citizenry and it it shouldn't go any further than that i think that makes sense yeah Uh, i guess my final thoughts are this paper provided a lot of great vocabulary both that like she creates and also critiques from previous literature that's just super interesting and useful um i ag- definitely agree with her critique of luck egalitarianism insofar as the goal of egalitarianism you know should be what she lays out as like the end of like the positive and negative things she lays out depending on how she defines certain specific aspects um and her democratic equality while it needs a lot of explanations, especially for certain terms, um, seems to be a worthy goal and addresses some of many of the problems of luck egalitarianism as she laid out. Okay, nice. I look forward to editing this, even though it's going to be an absolute bear. That to must do be awful, so. honestly. Yeah, this, this, well, <laughs> given that's, you this will want me one. to compensate you for this. I will. I, I'm a, I was, <laughs> is that, it's bad brute luck. That I have to edit this? <laughs> Does Anderson care though? She well, Rakowski <laughs> certainly doesn't. <laughs> the editor just no. Yeah, he does care. Rakowski cares. Well, that's true. Actually, Rakowski cares. Actually, no. I'm... Wait, no. This is no. Option it's option luck. luck. Yeah, yeah. He wouldn't care. <laughs> he if any possible thing could have converted to option luck, it is just outside the ball game. I, so yeah. I, was, I was laughing earlier because right? of this. I looked up. Uh, hang on, this is my way here. This is Rakowski here. <laughs> Oh, wait, wait, hang on. In for me. He looks exactly oh. like what his views are. <laughs> leave them. Leave them, boys. Leave, leave them to die. <laughs> he could have had insurance. <laughs> was, you, you know what? He doesn't I, comment on the barriers to getting the insurance. Like, it was an option. You, you know what's actually a fatal flaw with obviously Rakowski's already flawed view, too? <laughs> you can spin anything as option luck. You can spin and like yeah. it's so easy to just that, reduce anything to option luck. Yeah, from that conversation, I thought it was very interesting, especially from like an economics perspective, that you could with a new vocabulary convert brute luck to option luck. That is actually very interesting um, and has consequences yeah. for like policy. Yeah, but Rakowski's a monster. <laughs> <laughs> We're like, gonna provide for this. 
<laughs> he's like if it's conceivable that there was an option presented to you with no regard to like what the barriers to that option were you simply have lost your privilege for it's any like, kind of compensation because this view is like unfalsifiable it's like you could have overcome almost anything <laughs> is it conceivable is it like is even if it is only one in a quadrillion like every single atom in the universe had to align was it was it an available option like, yeah sorry i I just thought that I don't remember the actual name of this fallacy, but it's something it's like, you know, contrasting a reasonable alternative with extremely unreasonable ones is, yeah, it makes your and her and her proposal is extremely reasonable. I just don't think that I I, like I think my entire issue with this episode was like, I didn't think that she I didn't think that her grounding for her claim was logically entailing its conclusion, even though it was reasonable. Right? Like that, I guess that was my whole issue with it. I'm just too brain dead to even continue. Oh, at this I'm point. I'm I'm really brain dead at this point. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode of Plato's Cave. Um, I always enjoy discussing topics with uh, with these two guys. So if you want to um, support the show in any way, you can do so simply by sharing it. Uh, I'm hoping to get this show out to more people. Uh, and so if you want to share it on Twitter or social media, that would really help me. Uh, you can also rate it on Apple Podcasts. Uh, like this video if you're watching on YouTube, or subscribe uh, via Apple Podcasts or an RSS feed. Uh, you can also discuss it on your own show and link back uh, to my website, or you can connect me uh, with recommended guests or topics to cover. Uh, you can get in contact with me at Plato's Cave Podcast at gmail.com, follow me on Twitter at Jordan underscore C underscore Myers, and I now have a website for my philosophy endeavors at jordanmyers.org. If you want to know a little bit more about me and my fellow co-hosts, um, as I said in the introduction, I'm a master's student in philosophy at the University of Houston. I did my undergrad at the University of Pittsburgh, where I studied mechanical engineering and philosophy. And now that I'm back at school, I'm hoping to more closely study uh, moral responsibility, free will, ethics, epistemology, and moral psychology. Those are topics that I was uh, introduced to and got really interested in in my undergrad work. So uh, Adam and Giffen accompanied me on this show. And Adam is uh, one of my oldest friends. We actually met in kindergarten um, and we've been interested in philosophical topics for as long as we can remember and in a lot of ways it's been the basis of our friendship. Uh, Adam studied chemistry and biology at Cornell and he is currently working at a law firm um, and he's especially interested in moral responsibility as well but also law, religion, and free will. Uh, Giffen is also one of my oldest friends and uh, we've been friends since elementary school as well. Um, Giffen studied biology and economics at RPI, and now he works in human health research. Uh, he believes that there's very interesting overlap between both of his fields of study and philosophy, and he's particularly interested in exploring political philosophy. So this series was right up his alley. Um, and with, uh, with all of that information, Again, I hope that you enjoyed uh, this episode, and I hope that you get in contact with me or, or follow my work in any way that you uh, deem reasonable to do. So with that, thank you for listening.